call the select board meeting to order. Today is January 21st, 2020. We are airing on Verizon Channel 33 and Comcast Channel 22. Uh, on tonight's agenda, we'll have liaison reports followed by the town manager report and public comment. We'll then be approving a debt sale. Uh, we will be voting to dissolve the RMLD dividend subcommittee. Uh, we'll have an update on building security. Um, as well as an update from the on economic development and discussing the new economic development subcommittee or excuse me, committee, we'll have a lengthy discussion on downtown parking, um, and we should close after that. So let's start with liaison reports, John. Um, yeah, I've got two fairly quick ones. One is uh, um, just a reminder. Um, the, I had the uh, I had my monthly office hours visit which is a two and a half hour adventure and I really enjoy it down at the senior center. Um, they keep me there till bingo starts and then I, and I get kicked to the <laughs> curb. But, um, I'm hearing from them uh, because they watch. Um, the, a, lot of the, a lot of people that use the senior center watch. Um, everybody's kind of excited about the idea that we might survey our senior citizens to see what they're looking at for program and um, you know my visits with them really are kind of all over the board so I think it's really important to you know to do two things one is to maintain that monthly visit as best as everybody's able to fit it into their schedule and secondly that as we move towards our bigger goals and objectives that we think about that um, that review uh, the other thing is on one of the uh, projects that I'm liaison to the postmark project um, just to catch everybody up to date on that one the building is currently completely weather tight so that's closed up and they're you know so they're doing what they do outside when the weather permits and on the inside they're full bore ahead um, mechanical electrical and plumbing are all roughed in and so that means on floors two three and four they're they're going to it uh, the basement slabs are all poured and settled um, siding has commenced um, and what they what they've done is they've totally alarmed the building for intrusion protection because it's at that place and it's really important um, for everybody's safety it's a no pre no trespassing zone and they've added an element of um, you know intrusion detection which I think was a wise choice um, also to report there's 50 units there 10 of which will be affordable but of those uh, remaining 40, 30 of those have been spoken for. So if you're interested, get down there, because there's only 10 of those left. Um, and uh, the affordable housing market will commence in February. So those, those 10 will you know, hit the market in the appropriate place and in the appropriate uh, manner at that time. I, I just think this is one of those projects that we can point to that's worked really hard to work with the town um, and is doing a good job. So that's me. Thanks, John. Mark? In the interest of speed, I will pass. Okay. Thank you. Andy? Okay. So I, in the interest of time, I will be as, I'll, I'll be brief. Just one topic. Um, I, I, this uh, past week or so, I communicated with Bob and his staff about the two additional positions, a second tree climber and a benefits coordinator uh, that are under consideration <coughs> in the latest budget document. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll be brief, but I hope perhaps at our next meeting we can deliberate more on this if, if, it's, <coughs> if the board so wishes. Um, I feel that the benefits coordinator is a need, not a want. Um, thanks to Sharon Angstrom, our accountant, and Andre Kumi, our treasurer who gave me a crash course in the complicated world of insurance. Um, I, I think um, this, this, this position will greatly benefit the town financially. And, and again, thanks to them for actually uh, doing the assessment to, to um, realize that we needed this position. Regarding the second tree climber, um, right now, I learned that if they need additional tree removal help, um, the supervisor will pull a, an employee from another division. Um, 
having a second tree climber, I understand, would reduce the number of times that would happen. Um, but for me, with an eye on stretching the override as long as possible, um, I, I would put this more uh, into a want category. I understand the want. I just think that um, the current practice is, uh, is the way to go with this. Thank you. Thanks. Ken? Uh, I, thank you, and apologize to anyone if this, any of this has already been covered, but um, first, thanks to ATRAC for putting together a really wonderful event yesterday with the MLK celebration. I know they were operating with um, fewer than normal uh, 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 cohort of members, and they, they still managed to pull off a really wonderful um, celebration. Uh, I think two meetings ago, we had discussed the uh, status of the um, of the Lincoln uh, Prescott uh, development and and the Met and I think at that point we had thought that the appropriate um, place for residents to bring concerns was at the ZDA hearing the following night um, and my understanding is that that public comment was limited to the two items that were before them not the whole host of issues that could come um, re relating to the Met. Uh, and so I've heard, I heard um, back from town staff that any additional concerns can, can be directed uh, to town staff. And I think it was specifically uh, uh, Julie, Julie, yeah. Julie Mercier. Yeah, and it was, but yeah, and, yes, so. Great, great, thanks, Anne. <coughs> That's everybody. Uh, so I have an update on the RMLD payment uh, discussion. So back in uh, the fall, they had uh, RMLD had a consultant study released. Um, it's on the RMLD website. I encourage you all to take a look at that. <coughs> um, Mark and I, as liaisons to RMLD, have reached out a couple times to try and further the discussion on the payment and the formula, um, which is the reason why we froze the payment at the 2.48 million uh, through next June. Um, the study itself um, sort of made certain assumptions, um, and it has a few flaws. I, I don't think it took into consideration all of the <coughs> variables that it could have. Um, in far as discuss, um, considering RMLD's financial situation as a whole. <coughs> Big takeaway from it uh, is that they have a few proposals as, in terms of what they are recommending for the payment to be moving forward. Uh, and what it amounts to is that the current recommendation is that half a million dollars would be cut from the payment that Reading receives from RMLD. Um, this would have tremendous ramifications for both the towns and the schools, especially following um, the override from just two years back. Um, it would also undo some of the efforts, potentially, that the override allowed us to make progress on, especially on the school side. So what it le where it leaves us, and I've had this conversation with Bob, is that we would have to have discussions for what how that will impact the budget that we are currently reviewing. So that's fiscal year 21. Um, so that's my report. Mark, I don't know if you want to add anything there. Um, yeah, well, this will lead to our, our third item later right. in terms of dissolving the subcommittee. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that in addition to what, what Vanessa mentioned, um, these proposals are in front of the, of the board. They've asked for input from the Citizens Advisory Board. I'm not sure of the exact timing, but I would imagine that maybe on Thursday mm -hmm. uh, that they'll be getting that feedback. Um, I think that our concerns certainly are, number one, related to the amount of the payment and the impact it could have on the town. Um, but secondly, you know, RMLD as being part of the town has um, the ability to work with the town to raise funds and other things also. And it may be that that's a discussion that we need to continue to have with them. So that the, the notion of if there are funds required to do certain activities, they have the resources uh, of the town uh, that they're able to use in certain ways also. Okay. And I just want to make sure that um, we're able to share that. We, we've, um, I don't want to get into the third item, I'll, I'll, I'll stay clear of it, but um, I think it would be good to allow for that discussion. I agree. Um, so, yes. so they have fundraising, so you're suggesting they have fundraising abilities beyond rate paying? Mark? Yes. And are we going to get into that tonight? 
Uh, no. no. So it's not an agenda item for tonight. It's right. just a report, but uh, we can certainly put something on the agenda for our February 4th meeting if we want to have further discussion. Yeah, I think we should. Okay. Um, all right, Bob, anything else you want to add on that? Uh, not on that. No. Okay. Um, I have some other things, if you don't mind. Uh, Are you done? I am, thank you. <laughs> Um, a couple of updates, and I'm sure there's some public comments on, on these. Um, the town has arranged a meeting on January 30th. That's a week from Thursday at the public library, 7 o'clock, to discuss the Daniels House. Those that have been interested are on an email list, but if others have not received information from the town, they should pre please just, uh, just e either call my office or email me. I'm townmanager at ci.reading.ma.us. All you got to remember is town manager. The rest is all of our email addresses. Um, we're happy to send out all the correspondence and all the information we have as, as we have done so far to some of the neighbors. And just so I say the words out loud, there's a reported uh, letter that was put in some people's uh, mailboxes and doors over the weekend with one of town staff's names on it. It did not come from the town. I would hope that most people would recognize that fact. Um, Julie's very good at grammar and punctuation for one thing, so she just wouldn't have issued it the way, and we would have had town letterhead, it would have been much more formal. But just to say that out loud, I think it was a misunderstanding that someone probably meant to say, contact this person, and forgot that sentence, so it looks like the person sent it out, but she did not. Um, so again, 7 o'clock on January 30th, we'll hit social media later in the week and make sure everyone knows, and we'll also advise the neighbors more formally with a notification, although I'm a little reluctant to go door to door now. Um, the, sec the second, and I, I see John in the room, um, there's been some small cell uh, discussions and in fact a hearing with DPW was on the board's agenda in February. Um, John, pl please feel free to add because you were at the meeting, but my understanding was um, that um, the hearing that Public Works had was continued and it was continued uh, to such a time and date that it will not appear in front of this board before the election. Um, as a, again, secondhand, I've heard that RML Dave might be reconsidering and allowing co-location on some of their polls, which would obviate the need for a separate poll. So to be discussed, but this board will not see that discussion. A future board may see that discussion. Uh, excuse me. Mm -hmm. I said it, uh, it is on the RMLD agenda to discuss this topic okay. on Thursday night. Okay, good. Uh, Colleen sent me an email at, and about an hour ago. I haven't had a chance to look, so it might be that very fact. Um, the chair asked me to go over the debt sale a little, so not to steal, steal too much of Andre's thunder, but the town sold $4 million uh, of building security debt, uh, a little less than $2 million of Turf 2 debt, and a million for a Grove Street water main. Um, as I re reviewed the numbers, and I'm not usually surprised at finance, I'm supposed to know it, but I was really su surprised at the magnitude of the debt sale versus what we budgeted. So if we go back to November Town Meeting's capital plan, the uh, building security and turf two projects were budgeted over 10 years to cost $7.7 .7 million. The actual cost came in at $6.2 million over 10 years. Um, part of that, half a million or so, is because the turf two project was well managed and the bids came in under budget. It ended up that uh, facilities, schools, and uh, engineering and DPW staff did a chunk of the work. And the rest is just a million dollars of savings on financing. So I just wanted to, again, tip my hat to the finance department. They did a great job. Um, you know, not to go too deeply into the RMLD discussion, but, you know, there's $100,000 right there that has not, that has no need to be used. So there's $100,000 savings in next year's debt service budget that we don't need anymore. Normally I'd slide capital in. I have no intention of doing that. So there's at least one step uh, in that direction. Um, I've told some of you this, but um, I have decided to add Matt Cronellis, and, and Matt's thrilled to do it, to the PTTF meetings. We're finding that communication really needs more certainty and more stability. I have tried to attend all the meetings, and, and as a result, I'm four months behind the manager's meetings that I go to, and I really need to start going to those. And it's on the same day, typically. So between Matt and I, we'll always be at the meeting and we'll make sure that there's always feedback to the residents because things come in from you, things come in from police, from Matt, from me, many different ways that they come in. 
and usually they're covered the same way on the reverse. But this way, Matt will always be a contact person, so anyone can find out, did we get back to the resident? So I know the board has asked for that kind of feedback loop, and as a practical matter, now Matt and I have that covered. One of us will be there. Thanks, Pete. Certainly. And, and lastly, I, I got a brief thank you. I won't read the whole thing, but the Cultural Council, uh, Don Schenkel, was um, very happy with the town's allocation in the current year's budget and they awarded fourteen thousand dollars of grants nine thousand was from the state and five thousand was from the town and they wanted to make sure that uh, bob the fin finance committee and the select board were thanked so thank you that's all they have thanks bob all right so we'll move into public comment um so we're not used to having so many people so it's wonderful welcome thank you for coming um what is going to happen is i will ask if uh who would like to speak you can raise your hand i recognize you Please give your name and your address. Um, and given the number of people in the audience, I would ask if you could keep your comments to under two minutes, it would be appreciated. Um, and, uh, no, please, no derogatory or campaign related comments. And uh, who would like to speak? Laura? Thank you. Um, I'm Laura Dem, the town clerk. I just wanted to put a word out there that we really desperately need some election staff members to volunteer for the March 3rd election, I'm short about 60 people. So if um, if we can, I, I have to have about 130 bodies all day long. Um, so I'm short quite a bit. Anybody wants to volunteer? What are the requirements, registered voter? Or not? Um, must be a registered voter of the state of Massachusetts. Okay. okay. And unfortunately, the moderator and the select board cannot work the elections if you're a current seating select board member. So if I can get you to go out there and drum up some help, though, that would be very helpful. Okay. Okay? Yeah. Very much appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you, Laura. We'll do. Next. Thanks, Laura. Uh, I just quick, um, Megan Fiddler Carey, 64 <coughs> Charles Street. I'm a member of the Reading Cultural Council, so I just wanted to get up in person, uh, reiterate that. Thank you. It was very appreciated and it was really fun to get out more money to pay out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, um, how many of you would like to speak on the Daniels House? Just to get an order of magnitude here. All right. Is there anyone who doesn't want to speak on the Daniels House on some other topic? Yes. Hi, it's Bob. I'm John, John Brzezinski, uh, 60 Towers Park, longtime resident, and also, uh, also a business owner, a property owner, 274 Main Street, Reading, building I own. And this is just to echo Bob's comments with small cell and town policy, so I just had to note the board and think it's something worth considering and discussing at the board level. Uh, Bob, Gene have been very involved with this, but what's happening in towns like Reading and other communities around here is there's been a SEC ruling that's kind of changed uh, the way that these companies coming in putting in small cell antennas uh, operate. And uh, you've seen that here in Reading. What's going to happen in the next few years, we're going to have hundreds and hundreds of these things, potentially. Uh, and for uh, informational purposes, a small cell antenna is exactly what it sounds like. It's to fill in gaps in 4G coverage and eventually get the 5G coverage. But because of the way they're, I'm not an RF engineer, but because of the way they're designed, they have a range of hundreds uh, of feet to maybe a quarter mile, and most to need to cycle a lot of them. And uh, the current um, discussions in town, uh, actually one of them is uh, involving a pole being situated directly in front of my building, a uh, new utility pole, despite the fact that there are multiple utility poles 155 feet away from where that pole is. Uh, and there's been, uh, I've had discussions with Argo V at length, with Bob, and um, there just seems to be, I mean, if, they, if the town and the Board of Selectmen want, um, you know, basically all the stakeholders in town to have, you know, some visibility to this, I think it's this is the time you need to do it right now. And I'm here if you want to ask, answer any questions or ask any questions about, uh, about this. Thanks, John. Um, John, I didn't get to tell you this, but I just saw your email to the board. Um, in Reading, we tend to take shortcuts. So Burlington went through a pretty significant public process, and we just stole their policy. Yeah. So if you look at theirs and Reading's side to side, we have the same town council. I was alerted an hour and a half before the deadline and should just change Reading from Burlington to Reading, and we'll use that. So you're right, we haven't gone through any process, but it's not a bad start. Yeah. So. Thanks, Bob. Question okay. for John. John, can you comment on, uh, Bob mentioned that there's a postponed or additional yeah. DPW hearing. When is the date of that? I'm sorry? 
When is the date of that hearing? The date, so it's the first Monday in uh, February. February. It's the 10th. Or maybe it's not the first one. It's the 10th. So, yeah, because basically what happened is there is there's a proposal in place with a contractor representing AT&T called Tilson that is proposing putting two new utility poles, uh, two entirely new poles, and one in front of my building, one at the corner of Ash Street right by McDonald's, um, and they'd be adding the infrastructure on there. And uh, at the same time, there actually is a proposal that uh, I didn't know about, we didn't know about Verizon Wireless is trying to do an agreement with RMLD right now for about 40 of these. And what we agreed in that meeting was that ATT will look into if they can kind of leverage that same sort of agreement. So it's, you know, if that wasn't brought up, then they might have had the full approval. Other public comment? What is the date of the hearing? Uh, my name is John Means, 19 Cape Cod Ave. Um, I'm a resident of Reading as well as a business owner. I mean, business for computers. Um, I want to talk about 59, real fast out. Me, former day or something. Um, I'm here really to voice a concern. Um, we've gotten the letters from Julie. That is unfortunate about the letter that went around. That really is, because Julie has been very transparent. She's been amazing and right on top of everything for us. And we thank her for that. Thank you. Um, Unfortunately, she's not here, but we can say that. Right there. Right there. Right there. <laughs> no, really. It's not time, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, I saw it like, like that, but I mean, yeah. Um, I saw it. That was the first thing I thought. I'm like, ooh. Anyways. Um, really, why I'm here is to voice a concern about the possibility of the what's going to go into that residency. Uh, we do live in a zoning area that is a residential family area. Um, and I think everyone is just really concerned mainly about the safety. Um, I we know that our hands are tied. There's limited, there's limited options we can do to prevent something that we don't agree with going in. But I think, you know, everyone here, and I speak for myself and some of the people in the neighborhood, and I think for a lot of people in here, that we can relate to what's going on as far as what they want to put in there as far as maybe a sober home, a rehabilitation facility. I think everyone in this room has been touched by addiction in the last decade. It's a national epidemic. We realize that. And we're sensitive to that. But there's a time and a place for everything. And what I've been saying to some people is that the key word in that sentence is and. And understand that this is the time that we need to help a lot of these individuals. But this isn't the place. This is a family resident area. Right across the street from the library. Now when it was a elderly nursing facility, we understood what was in there. Really hard to expect unsafe actions happening from those tenants. But when it's a possibility of 27 unknown tenants going into a big facility that does not fit into the neighborhood as most sober homes are supposed to under the MASH requirements, this is a big facility. We don't know how management's gonna be able to manage and keep that safe. I can't say that they will, I can't say that they can't. There is obviously not. Of, of responsibility by them too. The larger number of people, as we all know, in one congregated area does most times lead to a little bit of instability. Why I'm speaking today is to ask for your help in this situation. I don't think it's, in, it's anyone in this room's fault that we're in this position and talking about this and the possibility of something like this being brought to Reading. But I think we can all come together as a collective group to make sure that this is the right decision. And if it is, if it is something that goes through, that we do it the proper way. If we're not careful about the way something like this is approved, then more and more and more of these type of facilities can easily get into an area like Reddit. What we want is preservation of our family and tight knit neighborhood. There are kids that run all around our neighborhoods with the freedom of knowing they're safe. My son, he's seven years old, about to turn eight, 
he said to me, Dad, I've been waiting so long to be able to just walk up to the library all by myself and go and study, meet a friend, read a book. I'm really nervous that this place moved in and there's all these strangers in there. I tried to tell him that, you know, a lot of these people that move into these type of places, they're really trying to turn their lives around. They're trying to be better. But there are a lot of extracurricular items that come along with this. And we need help to make sure that this is not done in an improper way. And right off the bat, I will say, they have been very, this is the word I'm gonna say, sketchy about what their involvement is in the neighborhood, what they're putting into the building. They've gone from one designation to another. There have been some individuals that have run into the occupants that are going into the building. They were not even a leaf bit friendly. They've done nothing to reach out to the neighborhood. They've done nothing to make us feel, all right, well, they have this under control. Maybe this is a lot more fear than anything. They've done nothing to ease that tension. And when you look up these com this particular company, along with their particular council, there's a lot of shady background. And that's making us feel more and more uncomfortable about this entire situation. We really want to make sure that our neighborhood is preserved to be a family-friendly neighborhood. That is why myself, my wife, my family, and many of the other families have moved into this neighborhood. Because it's family-friendly. It's right next to the library. We shouldn't have many worries about over-congested traffic now. You know, bring up an example. Even when it was the elderly nursing, the employees that work there, they sped up and down my street very fast to and from work. Whether they were running late, they hated their job, who knows? But they wanted in and out of there fast. And that was when it was an elderly nursing home. I can't imagine what it's going to be like if it's occupied by non-elderly individuals, and many of them. So again, I am voicing my concern about this potential occupancy and voicing a word of help. We need your help through this. There was a similar situation, just to let you know, and you can look it up online, that happened in Dorchester. The difference, number one, was there was a sober home trying to move in. They were trying to bully themselves in. It had the same council as this individual occupancy has. The exact same council. He did the same tricks. Changed designations over oh, this, over that, over this tried to get in. The city council stepped up and stepped in for the citizens of Georgia, brought them to the table and said, we're going to require these many requirements for you to be able to move in. Every single requirement of MASH has to be met. Now whether you as a group are able to help us out in that particular way, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's not. You know, we, we, I know this is all beginning stage. But we are asking for that type of support, that type of help. We are your citizens. We are your constituents. We need that support. We can't get it from you guys, and I have to get it from someone else. But that's why I'm here, and that's why I like to voice my opinion. On behalf of myself and many of my neighbors. And thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Is there other public comment? Yes. Hi, my name is Amy Nagy. I live at 42 Grand Street. Um, I'd just like to echo those concerns, except um, I'd like to broaden it a little bit. For those in the audience who don't know this, sober homes are not regulated under federal or state law. So, if a sober home would like to open up, they can say, we will only have 27 residents, which is already a lot of residents. If they'd like to have more, they can look at us until we're blue in the face and say, there's only 27, they could fit 75 if they wanted to. They could say that there's a, a ratio of one staff member for every five people who live there. They could have one staff member for 75 people living there. They could tell us that this board of health is not allowed in the front door because they are a protected class of disabled citizens, and we won't know what's going on in there. My biggest concern is that because we cannot trust what they say, not because they're bad people, not because they are horrible people coming in, but because they are not held to any regulation, 
what that will do, one to the neighborhood, I live close by, but not close enough that I, I don't think that it would affect my day to day. But this town paid for a library, and we all paid for that library, and we pay for it dearly in our taxes every month. And that is the most used um, uh, facility by the community in this town. What I am concerned about happening is that that will become a taxpayer rec room for a sober community with no regulation. That should be mentioned is a for-profit facility. So a for-profit facility, and please let me just take off the table, we all have been affected by people who need help, but this is a for-profit facility, which means they're profiting from people who need help. They're gonna profit from our community and from those who need help. We have no life to stand on to say you can't put 75 people in there. You can't offer anyone to stay there for any amount of money you want to charge them. We can't say you have to have a police officer there. We can't say the fire department has to come in and make sure that it's safe for everyone because it's a single family dwelling. A single family dwelling that can house at minimum 27 people. My biggest concern, like I said, is the library. I'm concerned for the neighborhood, of course, but I think this is not a neighborhood problem. I think this is a town-wide problem. And my concern is that the town is already strapped financially. So if we're going to look at, and, and don't misunderstand that I'm not calling, I'm not saying that all of these people are horrible people who are addicted and seeking help. But the fact of the matter is their disease is stopping them from putting their own best interests ahead of their disease. So we cannot expect them to put the self-interest of our community ahead of their disease. So what's going to happen when we have the first person who overdoses in the library? Sober homes have people overdosing all the time. This is a community-funded building. There's nothing we can do. I understand it's, it's discrimination to say we don't want them here, you can't be here, you can't use the library, <coughs> the library is open for everyone to use it. But in a cash-strapped community, we can also can't say, all right, well, let's have a police officer there. Let's have a resource officer in the library 24-7. We can't do these things. So we're really sitting here saying, what is it that we can do? What's frustrating for those of us who've actually kind of looked into this is that the rights of the for-profit sober homes supersede the rights of anyone around them. So we have laws in this town. There are things that we can and cannot do. They don't have the things that we can and cannot do. They don't have those laws. So I think that as a community, I understand that the city, the town's hands are tied because the last thing I want to do is pay these people any more money that could possibly happen through a lawsuit of discrimination. Um, so we understand that people's hands are tied, but I think we're looking for some guidance on what we can do to protect the town. Not from people seeking help, but from those who are running for profit, unregulated solar centers. Thank you. Thank you. Other public comment? None? Okay. Uh, Carla? I have, can I ask Laura a question? Of course. What happens if you don't get the 60? But we have to have at least um, 12 people per precinct. Uh, other than that, I'd have to contact the state and say you need to send us some people. The state would kind of step in. We hope that doesn't happen. Uh, back to the Daniel's house question. Uh, Barbara, Julie, can you just comment on the Gen 30 meeting? And if I understand correctly, we were the town was able to arrange this? Is that correct or um, yeah the uh, we met with the uh, buyer was it October maybe it was the middle of December I was okay we, we, we were contacted so. by them early and then we had a meeting with them and they agreed to have a neighborhood meeting but clearly that wasn't happening so last week we said all right we have to hold a neighborhood meeting we'll at least invite him and so far he's agreed to come you know which would be helpful um, the speakers raised a lot of issues and I, I will say it is a very complex legal issue so the town has to step carefully. It doesn't mean it can't do anything, but it just has to step carefully. And I would highly uh, advise you to come. We have asked RCTV to put it on TV, but we don't know if it'll be able to be live. It might be taped. So 
Uh, if it's cold, you might be able to stay home and watch it, but you might not be able to watch it live. We don't know yet. Um, but I would suggest as, as many of us that are interested come. It's the downstairs, both conference rooms and the library. Um, I'm sure we'll all learn some things and what tools we do have and what tools we may not have. Um, beyond that, it's really difficult to comment with any specificity, but we, we will have experts in the room. We will have our town council there. We will have Ju Julie and uh, you know, many others from the town side. We'll also have Erica McNamara from the uh, band formerly known as Arcasa, as we call them. Um, we have a member of a sober home from Wakefield that's been on the board for years, and he would echo everything you said about being unregulated, and he has pushed the industry to regulate and found a lot of resistance on Beacon Hill for reasons none of us understand. Um, he's one of the ones that started the MASH certification because he understands that you need to have rules. Um, but I don't know how far the town can push this, as, as you mentioned. We'll, we'll all learn something on the 30th. Bob, um, and a, uh, first of all, a quick comment. Ann and I will not be able to make that meeting because we have a previous uh, uh, committee meeting um, that we're obligated to. Um, so apologies on that. The the certificate, the so so the concern about them having uh, more than 27 or 29. If they say they have 29 residents and they end up with 70, um, it, does the certificate of occupancy? The certificate of op occupancy must say. Uh, you can't have more than this many people living in a building. I mean, I, I really can't answer a legal question, Andy. You're like asking that. a common sense question, yeah. but unfortunately it has a complicated legal answer that okay. I just can't share. I don't know. Can I mention that um, I hate it, yeah. um, in Wakefield, there, uh, there's a lot of Austin Globe articles that you can read about it. In Wakefield, the, the fire department was called, went into a home, didn't know it was a sober home, found 50 people in a single family home, mm. in cots in the basement, yeah. tripled up in rooms, sleeping in the kitchens. They um, were horrified with what they found because they thought they were just walking into a single family home. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, there's real concerns with where you have people sleeping, and um, if there is a fire, to know if there's 50 people, you have to find, you have to go into a basement, you have to go into an attic, you have to really account, have a process to account for all these people. Yeah. Re they reached out um, and said, we need to put sprinkler systems in, we need to know who's here, we need to have processes. The letter that came back was, we are a protected class, we don't have to do anything you ask. Um, one last comment to John again. Um, under the math, MASH regulations, I believe it's regulation number 30, or 39, I could be wrong, don't quote me on that, but it's definitely in the 30s, that the occupancy must, and it says it directly, must fit in and look like other houses in the neighborhood. <coughs> it must, you must not be able to even tell that it is a sober home. The Daniels house is not like any other house in our neighborhood at all. It is a large facility. And now, us as neighbors, two streets over or one street over from me, but on Bancroft, there's a mental disability home. And nobody complains about them because they don't put up a key. And their house, the house that they are in, the occupancy, looks just like any other house in the neighborhood. They fit into that regulation perfectly. And they are very kind, they are very transparent about everything that goes on there and very open. That's, I think, a big concern for all of us, is that that's not the case so far with this company. They're not being transparent or open or very welcoming, and they're moving into an occupancy that is unlike any other place in our neighborhood. And that's a MASH requirement. So I just wanted to bring that up to your attention in case not, if you weren't aware. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other public comment? Uh, okay. Do we uh, want or need to post for that meeting? I will plan to attend. Uh, I will also attend, and that's on my list for it to ask Bob. So okay, Bob, right. can you post us for next Thursday? Wait, no, still no, my time. Caitlin, no. All right. Um, <laughs> so uh, I do. I do have one comment. Um, just it, the neighbors asked for help. Uh, in the spirit of full disclosure, I also live in this neighborhood. I live on Grand Street. 
Um, one of the things, if, if you as neighbors are looking for help, um, my advice to you is to be organized as a neighborhood, um, separate from public meetings. And the reason I suggest this is because we've seen good results working with other unrelated to this issue, but with other developers. Um, when the neighbors get together, are organized, have a one or two people point of contact, um, and they speak for the group uh, that has worked well in the past. Um, it helps to have one point of reference for the town and for the developer. Um, it helps with disseminating information. So everyone is welcome, of course, to participate however they like. Um, but for future discussions, it's something you may want to consider. Thank you. Yes. I'm Hannah. I don't want to take I just want to clarify. Um, is he a developer? Is Cougar going to be at this meeting? Because there's two groups involved. Um, there's Cougar, who bought the building, and then a process recovery center who is now going to lease the building. Um, so I'm curious, who is going to be at this meeting, number one? Number two, um, is he a developer? Because it doesn't sound like he's developing this piece of property. I'm just curious, yeah, Cooper question. is, and Bob, then do you know the because he's leasing it to a group that I believe is waiting to move in um, from what I can gather. Um, and I just want to echo the MASH standards. Like, this is cannot be overlooked. I mean, it needs to fit into the neighborhood, drive by that house. It just not fit in um, as a single family. Um, and then there's also a proposal on the table that there's it's a detox treatment. And I think the last letter back from their lawyer, who um, his first letter was very bullying, um, is <clears throat> that he um, that they were uncertain what they want to use it for has the town got any clarification from that um, that's that's one of the issues when you use the term developer we don't know what they want to do so maybe that's not the right word to use we'll see uh, both parties have said they will attend on the 30th the owner and the proposed tenant so we'll take it from there okay, thank you. Bob can we can we say out loud the name of the proposed tenant? I don't remember. Do you remember who? <laughs> Process Recovery Center. Process Recovery Center. Oh, okay. I know they have a presence in New Hampshire. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Bob. Any other public comment? All right. Seeing none, thank you very much. Um, all of you are, of course, welcome to stay for the rest of our meeting. You are welcome here, of course. Um, but we will be moving on for the agenda. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Vanessa. Yes. Two minutes. Uh, and we'll take a two minute recess.
We are back in session. Thank you, everyone. Next up on the agenda, we will be approving a debt sale. Um, I just wanted to, to say that um, one of the major factors that we were able to borrow at 1.06 was the AAA bond rating, bond rating that the town of Reading received. And that's mostly, um, as you saw the press release, that's included in your package related to the management style that we have, the budget process that we have. So it's very uh, essential that we understand the complications that the um, our finances um, de depend on all these processes that we do. So um, I just wanted to point that when you talk about the IMLD payment, when you talk about school, when you talk about town, all of those will affect the triple A bond rating that the town of Ferry has. So it's they're all related together. So I just want to point that out that when you make decisions about finances for the town, they they will affect the um, the rating that we have. And to borrow at 1.06 percent, it's I believe it's a record, right, Bob? Or I think kind of close. I think you should repeat that that number. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, for 10 1. years. 1.06, and that's for 10 1. years. 1.06 percent. So. Right. John. So, um, would this dividend reduction be a disclosure item in your last purchase? So that would it was correct. It's yes, something it was. we had to put in. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's the possibility. So we don't define it as a of it as a happening. We define no, it as a, a potential risk. A risk. Okay. Thank you. Uh, any other? discussion or presentation on the debt sale? There is a motion, and then there are yeah. lots of things to sign, which you can do at your leisure mm -hmm. during the meeting. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you, Bob. So, Mark, you can read the motion. And just to say, Mark doesn't have to read the whole motion if someone is right. willing to waive the reading. Okay. So, w would the motion be this uh, two-page vote of the select yes. board document? Yes. <laughs> Get started. <laughs> Someone, please be sure to get started. It. And a question is the uh, it, before, before I say two words, let me just ask a question where it says clerk. Is that read secretary or is it is yeah, okay? Very good. I, the clerk of the select board of the town of Reading, move the way. Is there a second? Second. We've all read it. I mean, it, I don't think yeah. there's anyone's going to yeah. All right. Um, all right. Uh, we need to have a vote to waive. Uh, all those in favor? Great. Uh, now to the motion. All those in favor of the motion as sort of read. <laughs> all those in That's favor? Right. All right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right. And so the paperwork will just be make the rounds. Yes. Um, there's the lines on this side. Um, or for all of you, and then Mark has a special one that says click. Okay. Mark. I have one that has only the clerk. Uh, I'm sending you the ones you need to sign. Okay, very good. Okay. Uh, so next up, we'll be voting to dissolve the oh, yeah. Yeah. So what, what were, this one's just so Mark, so we can start um, second. I think it'd just be interesting to, make sure Mark to um, oh, just Mark. get a look at. Maybe you could send it or send it oh, to us or put it in our next packet. Okay, I want to um, you. Not the whole application, not but it's, it's, it's kind of good. Perspective. Yeah, it's good to know what the, what is asked of us, mm -hmm. and you know, you know what the response it's is. Only to that. It would be a, an item of interest it's for me only. at least. I'm yeah, yeah. 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 So, and that would become part of our packet um, if you send that to us. So yeah. then it's out there for everybody to look at. Okay. Okay. Great. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, all right. So next up on the agenda, we have a vote to dissolve the RMLD dividend subcommittee. So this was originally formed uh, about two years ago um, to aid in the discussion of the RMLD payment. Now the payment was frozen about a year ago. Um, and the existing subcommittee, which consists of myself and Mark, um, doesn't actually have a purpose as the original subcommittee was created. Um, so there's actually nothing that Mark and I can do together to bring to the board for consideration. Anything that has to do with the RMLD payment has to be done in collaboration with the RMLD. Um, so talked with Bob, ran it past town council, um, and our suggestion is to dissolve the subcommittee. Just as a point of curiosity, when did you guys meet last? October. 
October. It was a while ago. Because I just don't remember. You know, I mean, I think it's kind of the last, the first time I heard of something changing was almost a passing comment mark from you mm. in our last meeting. Yep. Yeah. Um, so Mark and I have not met with um, RMLD. We have suggested it. it. They have not been receptive to that. So. Um, They've not been receptive to that. No. Just meeting with the two of you. Correct. It's interesting. So. I mean, October twenty second was actually. October twenty second. And that was the two of you meeting. Correct. With, the, with yourselves. Um, oh yeah. Yes. It was an open meeting. It was an open meeting. We, right. we posted. No. I, yeah. I get that. But I'm. I'm saying it wasn't. It was, it was just part of a discussion with RMLD. Correct. It, uh, it was primarily because Mark was the new liaison last year. It had been myself and Dan. Great. And so it was really just to catch Mark up on what we had done in the previous year and freezing the payment. But after that, there was really nothing Mark and I could do. So although you guys offered as a subcommittee to meet with them, no takers? Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. I mean, we reached out to have conversations to see if we could have some kind of a joint conversation. Informally. Okay. That is with with their subcommittee or the entire board, uh, I don't board know of trustees. They, what their subcommittee situation is. Yeah, I don't think they have a subcommittee. I don't think. I think they dissolved it after we froze the payment. In fact, I know they dissolved it after they froze after we froze the payment. So, so they don't have something. Do you have a feeling that that is um, the feeling of the entire board of trustees that they they're not interested in talking with the two of you or us or is it a we're, we're not certain not and certain. The, and commissioners but yes. Commissioners, right? And they Thanks. set a process in motion that's now moving ahead. That's where it is. Now. They've moved forward of their own without us. Without us. Right. Mm. Again, interesting. Yeah. Um, um, so, as it relates to this particular subcommittee, it's 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 a subcommittee without a purpose. Well, I mean, I certainly get the idea that dissolving it when you can't. I mean, for you guys, for you guys to be able to meet in a public setting to have a discussion with nobody else, you know, with nobody else to play, mm -hmm. um, it kind of doesn't make sense. You yeah. know, I'm just, and so I get the idea that we're going to suggest a, a, a dissolution of this subcommittee, but I raise the question just in general and in public, how is it that RMLD as a subsidiary of this town moves in its own direction without, you know, taking the two of you up on an offer to have a discussion. I, I just, I know that you don't have a good answer for that, but I think it's important to say it out loud. Um, and it causes me great concern, I will tell you that. Um, particularly as a citizen and as a ratepayer. Obviously my time on this board is waning. So it sounds like if you guys have spent a year trying to talk to them, I'm never gonna get to talk to them as a selectman. So, but, there are other ways to talk to them, for sure. As a citizen and a right thing. <laughs> so, so they, they do have a meeting on Thursday. Yeah, so mm -hmm. to that point, um, I will plan to attend the meeting on, on Thursday. Yep. And I wonder if the, the board would have interest in how I should present myself at that meeting. Certainly not speaking for the board or, or into any decision-making process. Um, but perhaps in representing our interests in, in a statement that's made or something like that. I don't know if the board has an appetite for that discussion. I'm happy to do it on my own as a citizen. Uh, but No, I, I, I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Um, you shouldn't answer that question until you've dissolved because you are still technically a subcommittee. Oh. Okay, let's get on with the business. Huh? And, and you would have to have post a meeting for Mark to go, even if he goes alone. Because the board has just given advice to a subcommittee. So. Well, the board can give advice to the subcommittee. And then, then they have to post that so. Whatever okay. you want. Uh, so, do we have a motion to uh, move to dissolve the RMLD dividend subcommittee? Second. Second. All those, uh, for the discussion. All those in favor? Great. Thank you, Bob. Not now. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, <laughs> so. <laughs> just I mean, a thought. But, well, because you, you had a 48-hour posting problem. Yeah. It's two days from now. Yeah. Got it. Oh, I see. Um, yeah, and Mark and I remain the liaison, so we both still yeah. you know, could go to meetings. Again, it's under, uh, under a different, for a different purpose. I, I mean, I, I, I know at least a couple of the, um, um, uh, the board, and um, 
they're pretty reasonable people. So I, I just think we need to um, start start talk, you know, start a conversation with them and, and get this cleared up. I mean, I, I can't speak for Mark. I've, we've tried that. Um, we've talked. I've, I've talked to them to say, you know, can with we, the board, with, with the, the group together, entire, um, you know, get the group together that was um, uh, organized last year. Which, mm -hmm. you know, Bob attended a meeting. I was there. Dan was there. Um, There's about a dozen of us in the room. Mm -hmm. um, so the efforts have been made. The, I think the key here also is that the commissioners have move forward a process without our involvement. Um, yeah. They commissioned a study. Um, it has a lot of loopholes. Um, yeah. You know, it's missing certain variables that I think are pretty critical when you talk about a payment to the town mm -hmm. um, and considerations that weren't included. So, you know, the fact that it hasn't been a collaborative process mm -hmm. in the last six or eight months um, is concerning. Can we send them a letter? Think, you know, I'm comfortable with Mark, you know, or Mark, saying something. Yeah. You know. yeah. So um, at the last meeting, I did bring up a question before they decided on process, asking that we could have more of a joint process. And the commissioners wanted to kind of move ahead in, in, in the direction with CAB and themselves. The CAB um, is the Community Advisory Board. It consists of a representative from each of the other communities uh, that are MLD services. We'll. Um, Will you, Vanessa, as the chair, have the opportunity to speak with our representative before Thursday? I mean, this is, when you look out at this room, half the people in this room right now have, I'm sure, a lot of questions about um, the topic of this dividend because it directly affects how they do their work, whether they're elected or um, people who are involved in the work that ties to the money that comes out of that dividend, or people who work for this town who are compensated in this way. I, you know, this is not something you can do in a vacuum, and I think it's really important that we send a very strong message that it, it's kind of not only impolite, it's probably inappropriate to do it in a vacuum, uh, particularly when you think about the impact around the table. We have the school committee here, um, and, you know, if we just think about half a million dollars um, and you know let's just use rough numbers and say 65 percent disappears out of their of that number disappears out of their budget mm -hmm. that is huge yes okay I mean that's a big number um, a lot of people in this town battled not battled but worked hard mm -hmm. towards you know and you know a permanent tax override um, 15% of which gets wiped out in one fell swoop that's been a discussion in a vacuum. That's not okay, um, um, in my opinion. I actually, I have been in touch with um, some of the commissioner, or, you know, I, I mark it. So I've actually spoken with our cab representative um, and expressed my opinion um, to him. Who is our cab representative? Vivek Kasani. Okay. He was previously the He was in the field. Field, yeah. but then we, we appointed running. him. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Yeah. yes. That's right. Okay. Thank you. Um, so but I, I would think that certainly the entire board should feel welcome individually to, to share their thoughts on that. And then I guess the question would be um, what role, if any, should I play at that meeting um, in terms of the board? Like, again, as a, as a citizen, I'm fine participating anyway. But do we want it as a board to have? Other the board is interested in a conversation. Mm -hmm. I think it's yeah. I think yeah. I'm, hearing I'm that from all of us, and I would certainly agree. Yeah. If you're willing to put something together, I'm comfortable with you speaking for the board. I may or may not attend. I don't know. Yeah, and we, you know, I think we got to be careful about that because you can't post it. It's too late. You know, for three of us to show up, right? Because it wouldn't be incidental. Believe me. <laughs> yeah. would be up. Uh, I I I want to I I remember a few years ago when relations um, between us and the commissioners were rock bottom, mm -hmm. and it wasn't good for the town. So so mm -hmm. I just want to be careful um, to not start a rhetoric war or a flame war, whatever they call it on. Uh, um, 
on Facebook. I hear hear the concerns. Um, it'd be nice to get into a room with them and have them explain their thoughts and uh, rationale and and have us uh, um, communicate our concerns if or or comments on, on what they're I mean, doing. I, I've done that. Yeah. Um, so I think part of the. The issue, I, I, I take yeah. your point, but it may be that we can turn it the other way, which is that I think this board has shared a desire to figure out how to work more closely right. uh, with the RMLD. And I, I think, frankly, um, in discussions I've had with some of the commissioners already, I think they share that. Mm -hmm. But we haven't kind of figured out how to, how to do that yet. And, and maybe this is part of that discussion. I, I think if it's kind of just about that, it's limiting and, and runs the risk of flaming. I think yeah. it's got to be a broader discussion of how do we how do we work together. One of the reasons I brought up the comment on potential fundraising, not not paying it back, but I believe that they could conceivably raise money essentially through the town. Is that correct? I don't know how. If they go out to raise funds, how would they do that? Through the issuance of debt. Oh, of course, they issue debt, certainly. Right. Sure. And so would benefit from AAA rating. Yeah. And so you know, if there's an issue of raising funds for capital projects or whatever, that could be a source that could be considered. And I would imagine that town would be very interested in that if that's the best way to do it. In fact, finding the best way to do it is the point. Well, particularly if, you know, the reduction of an income source would have a negative impact on the town's overall ability to be able to borrow, which would be a frightening thing. You know, Andy, with all due respect, I, I agree with you that I think we have to have as cordial, uh, you know, a conversation as possible. But we tonight just had to take action to dissolve a method, a methodology during those worst times that we yeah. used to initiate positive discussion. And yeah. we had to do that because we were paralyzed into a subcommittee that could not do anything other than <coughs> post meetings and have discussions among themselves. So, and you know, as far as comment commentary is concerned, I mean. Facebook has no interest for me. I mean, if I needed to talk to them, I will be there in person. It won't be a Facebook discussion. Oh, um, I wasn't so referring to having a Facebook discussion. Um, so I, I think, are we comfortable as a board having Mark put something together um, and presenting at or speaking on Thursday at their meeting? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And and Vanessa, I'm sorry. Just one more question on sure. this. Um, would. It, I'd ask the board, the board, would it be a good idea for all of us to have a joint meeting with all of them to start things off um, and share thoughts and then come up with a way to continue discussions? I think that could at least be on the menu of options that, that Mark could present and as possible of, of how to move forward. I, I, I think that's that's fine as an option. I think it is. They have a process that's that's moving. So the question mm -hmm. would be, are they willing to to change that process a little bit? And I, I will make the case that we think that that's a good idea. That'd be a great idea. I think expressing concern that these decisions don't get made in a vacuum is a really good idea. And I would have no problem with you representing us in that in that kind of a statement. I, all right, so thank you all. Uh, with that done, we will move on to the building security project update. So Bob, over okay. to you. Thank you. Um, this is a presentation that just embellishes on the one-page memo that you uh, you got uh, with a couple of details that are added, but not much. This is really more for the audience, for the public. Um, just to start off, um, this is a collab very collaborative effort between the schools and the town, you know, police, DPW, et cetera. Um, and the focus of the project, first and foremost, has to, been to emphasize student safety above all else. That should kind of go without saying, but I, I thought I should say it. But it's also important to, to consider that when all is said and done, we want to make sure the learning environment in the schools and the library are still there. So you don't want to turn things into a fort where you can't do learning. So we're very mindful of the final outcome in terms of that. Um, we also have a big challenge, which is when you think of what a school is, is, is built for and what a town building such as Town Hall is built for, they're opposites. Schools are locked down, very limited access. This is a public building. The public are supposed to be able to come in 
and, and not have a secret password. Um, then we had to design this project to work with different funding sources, which, which I'll circle back to, and to make sure that um, as we dug deeper into all the things we could do, you know, we found some things that we might someday like to do. So we made sure to s sort of discuss and design a project scope that would allow future expansion if other money became available. Um, I'm going to do this a little bit backwards on purpose. I'm going to end with a summary and a project budget and go over those details. But I'd really like to hit the components first, and you'll see why when I, when I get well, there. Did that print get smaller or did I get older right before my own very eyes? Nice. I think maybe a little of both, John. <laughs> is it too small? Because yeah, it is kind of small. Um, the dispatch center, as, as you've seen from a town meeting discussion, was one of the key parts of this. Um, that's, a, that's a shared resource for both the schools, buildings, and the town buildings. Um, we had come to town meeting and asked for $500,000 for the construction portion of this, but as we dug into the project, realized that really we needed to go th through an OPM and have some management in place first, and that's a, that's a procurement law. So town meeting converted the $500,000 to be generic money for project design, if you will. Uh, we now estimate that the, the dispatch center, the construction plus equipment will be 800000 so not much different than we had before. Um, this portion of the project is going to be bid separately. It'll have several vendors and subcontractors to it. So this is a standalone small part of the, pro of the big project. And, and obviously uh, it includes relocation of the dispatch function within the police station during construction. We just don't go away for six months. And that's part of the challenge, certainly, of this component. Um, the second and the most important component is improving access controls and cameras at school and town buildings. Um, of all the different ways you can affect, uh, especially student safety, this is by far the most important one, and that's proven through national work. We're going to have new access controls to all the school and town buildings. Three of those buildings already have some access controls, but we will have access controls in every, build, every school and town building, which includes about 75 external doors. Um, there'll be new policies for the use of buildings, and those policies can be customized for each building, so it doesn't have to be one size fits all so that schools and public town buildings can do their own thing. Um, some employee behaviors must change, and I'll, I'll say John's done a great job <coughs> with the high school. Um, they've already made those changes and suffered some of the pains that went with them. Um, it's not like uh, when my kids were at Barrows, the outside doors were open all the time and people came and went as they wished. That's not the world we live in anymore. Um, not every employee can have a key to come in whenever they want into these buildings, especially school buildings. So that's one of the changes that has to happen. Uh, we will certainly want to retain public access, but only during specific hours. One of the challenges we have in this building is what do you do between 5.30 close and a 7 o'clock night meeting? Typically, the building is locked for some portion of that. It's still under discussion because some people for night meetings come a little early. So it seems like a small thing, but we want to make sure the public feels welcome in these buildings. Um, some portions of the town buildings will have reduced public access. You know, I'll certainly point to Sharon's area and finance is not meant for the public to just walk in. And to continue, um, there will be new security cameras and wiring. Uh, two, three years ago when we started, we weren't sure if we needed to replace all the existing cameras, but we do. Uh, we've been through enough examples where we realize that's important. And this has to be hand in hand with the dispatch center change because these cameras have to communicate with the dispatch center. And we also have other backup locations in school and town buildings if for some reason the dispatch center went offline. Um, it's really important to say out loud, that, out loud that the cameras are forensic in nature. We are not having a staff person sit there 24 7 and stare at all the cameras to find out what's going on. However, uh, if something does occur, um, we will be able to uh, assist in a quick response to a location within a building or to the building itself. Um, so all existing cameras will be replaced with improved equipment. New cameras will be added with a focus on the high school and the two middle schools. Until we go out to bid, we can't be sure, but we've designed the bid packet so that if bids come in low, we can add some wiring, and if they really come in low, we can add more cameras as well to all the school and town buildings. So that's the thing I mentioned about scaling it for the future. The 
third piece, which seems comparatively minor, is hardening of building entrances. And largely what that means is intruder-resistant window glazing in the school buildings, especially on the lower levels and by the doors. And that will be done separately. Other components, not part of what I just mentioned, um, both facilities and public works have a role in this. Uh, public works will do some outside safety improvements. Those are not in the scope of this project right now, but some are clearly recommended. And then um, there'll be limited inside work done by facilities. They've already done some. To step back and now look at the whole project, there's a four and a half million dollar budget for the project with a capital P. Four million's in debt, we just told you about, and half a million was in free cash. But we also have additional sources. We have 75,000 as an earmark from the state budget, and certainly thanks to our senator and our reps for that. We have up to 80,000 in surplus funds from the library building project that I'll speak to the library director and, and possibly to the trustees about. I don't anticipate using it all for this purpose, certainly. Um, and then again, we have the targeted facilities and DPW work. <coughs> to dig into the four and a half million dollars a little deeper of the actual project, kind of with a capital P, 3.4 million is construction, construction and entrance hardening that I just reviewed. Uh, to give you a breakdown further, again, 800,000 is for the dispatch center, kind of a shared resource for us both. And then you can see our emphasis on the students with 2.2 million for the school buildings and just 400,000 for the town buildings. And that's clearly on purpose. Um, other components that are not construction per se are contingencies. So we have 240,000. If the bids come in a little high, we can absorb at least 240,000 above what we think the prices would be. Um, we have a list of alternates, such as wiring and such as more cameras, if the bids come in uh, where we think are even lower. There's two other components. I'll, I'll go to the bottom one first. 490,000 for consultant design and administration. Um, this is a project unlike any of our staff has ever done and has expertise for. Um, we very much needed to reach out to national uh, vendors for help on this. Um, we've used TRC for the last few years. Um, in executive session, you've seen one of their presentations. Um, we feel like we really nailed the expertise uh, we're doing something that is not typical in terms of tackling the whole community at once. Much more typical is there's a new school. How do we design a new school to have better security? That's what's done. They have not seen this approach before, but it's been interesting to work together on it. And then an owner's project manager, we actually have the same um, OPM as the library. We we're very lucky to, to get him. Um, he's, he's easily going to save what he, what he costs uh, by keeping an eye on all the construction. As you can imagine, the construction process is going to be challenging. It's not one building that you can take offline, fix, and then go back. It's especially tricky with schools. Um, most of the construction work can be done in the summer if the bids work out uh, in the next month or so. And that's how it's designed. But some of the work will go on when school is in session. And you just have to work carefully uh, around the students and not interrupt the learning that's going on. So the logistics of this, um, compared to a library project, I thought the library was complicated. This is much more complicated because of all the buildings in play at the same time. And because of all the different vendors that have to be going to all the buildings very quickly. So um, you know, we'll see how it works. We're going out to bid uh, sometime later in the month. Uh, later next month, I'm sorry. Um, we're going to ask for requests for bids. Staff, including the, the vendors we hired, have done pre-qualification on four, and there's four firms that qualified. As you can imagine, during this process, we really want to lock down the security information and just not put it out there for the world to see on, on the internet. So we went through a rigorous process that's again set at the national level, and only four firms qualified out of many more that, that attempted to. And the, the information they get will be detailed enough for them to put in a reasonable bid um, and just kind of stop there. We should be able to award a bid in March, as late, you know, possibly as late March would be the, the outside, and then to have some discussions in the first two months with construction to begin um, in the schools as soon as possible. So we, we put down June, and it, and it should to be clear, say June 2020, this June, and it's expected to go for almost a year to February 2021, <coughs> with an emphasis on the summer, but work will undoubtedly go on, on each end. 
dispatch will overlap. It's again a different project. The, the staff resources will have to jump back and forth. The OPM will help. But dispatch is expected to be under construction in July, July and December. And there's no specific time frame that's better or worse from them. That's just the way the bids worked out. If that needs to change to help the other schedule, that can be done. <coughs> Um, a little more than a year from now, we should have substantial completion on this project. Uh, but as anyone knows that's dealt with construction, it takes many more months before the thing is actually closed out. We only closed out the library project in the last six months. And I can't remember how many years ago that was really done. Uh, but we didn't get one of the parties to agree on the last bill in, until recently. So that's a high level discussion. I don't feel anything is breached security wise by giving you this, but I thought it was enough information because from, from what I've heard there was more concern not so much about anything I've told you tonight but about the things people didn't know is there going to be metal detectors you know what kind of things that would interrupt learning are going to happen and none of that is going to happen and certainly I welcome the schools to you know share in the conversation if they want to add anything uh, but so far it's been a very very detailed and rigorous process I think we're about two weeks or four weeks behind the schedule I thought we'd be on, but there's good reasons for that. It is very complicated. Um, but it is important that we get this bit out there, and I thought it was important for the, both the school committee and the board to get an update before we did that. Because there will be you know, public participation in terms of an RFP. So I don't know if there's any other questions, or John, you have anything you want to add? Okay. Thanks, Paul. No. Questions from the board? Mark? So, but with the, the RFP, is it, let me back up, mm -hmm. high school project, <laughs> problems with the contractor, mm -hmm. what safeguards do we have in place in the RFP process to minimize that, that opportunity for the problem, specific to no interruptions of learning and a good, other things we've learned? A good owner's project manager, the same one that did the library where we have no issues. So, it, it's, you have to pay attention to details. To the extent there's anything that's lingering, you, you have to nail it down and close it. You just can't ignore it. So again, we had this one architect bill where we had a verbal agreement to pay 40000 on a last invoice, and then the architect retired. And we couldn't get the firm to cooperate. Eventually, they said, sure, they're too busy to really worry about 40000 but that's the kind of thing that if unchecked, years down the road could have been, oh no, we never agreed to that. It's really, I don't know, you pick a number. So attention to detail and a good project manager is important, and we have those. In the upfront part of the RFP, are we able to specify quite a bit of information about the non-interruption of school activities, yeah. the timeline? And just to be clear, it's an RFP. I was corrected. It's RFP. a request for bid. Oh, excuse me. RFP. <laughs> yeah, I, I did the same thing. Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so that's, it's a quite a detailed process. So the, yeah. we're mandated to take the low bidder, I assume. As long as long as they're qualified. Yes, as long as they're qualified. Okay, so the qualification we want to make sure is as rigorous as possible. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. And that's why it was helpful to pre-qualify. Doesn't slow you down at this point in the process. So all four of those firms are eminently qualified to do this work. Great. Thank you. Yep. And by the way, there's many components. We're talking about the big kind of portion, but as I said, there's dispatch. There's a lot of subs contractors in there. There's lots of pieces. But this is kind of the big <coughs> building security portion that we're talking about. Thank you. Other questions from the board? There's school committee questions back there. <coughs> yes, Linda? Uh, Linda Snow Docs, our school committee. I'm just wondering if built into this is also, you mentioned that some of the work might be done while, if we have to while kids are in session. So I'm assuming that querying the workers that will be in the schools will be included. Right, so always. They'll yeah. all be queried and they will all be walked around either by the project manager or a member of facilities. They'll be with somebody who will be monitored. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Karen Herrick, Finance Committee. Um, I was just wondering, uh, was the was the 80000 that's left over from the library project, is that the I didn't realize there was any money left. Mm -hmm. Was that specifically held uh, aside? No. Nope. Just, just operating Amy, Amy's grinning back there. No, okay. it's just. They uh, were waiting for the Amy, final bill. Yeah, I was going to say. I have seen that. Until we paid that last 40000 we just couldn't declare anything. We just couldn't know. 
but now once Sharon has you know paid the bill, we can say it's about eighty thousand dollars surplus. So we'll work with them as to how that's spent. And it could go to free cash if we don't need it. No, I feel town meeting could vote it that way, but it can't automatically. Okay, it has to be directed to another debt issue. Yeah, right. Okay, so yep. just um, attention to details and making sure things get cleaned out. Okay, great. Yep. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Okay. Uh, thank you for the update, Bob. Thank you. Uh, School Committee, thank you for joining us. Yes. Uh, so next up, we will have, oh, sorry. Before we do that, um, I have a question on these documents that we're being asked to sign. Mm -hmm. That would be a good time to bring that up, because I see Andrew still in the room, too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, sure, go ahead. <laughs> or he runs. So, Andrew, just to make sure I understand, so these are all listed as 4% uh, interest rate. Uh, Vanessa, do you want to take another two I was going to say, yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, let's adjourn for two minutes yeah, while we clarify this. Join. So these are all set at 4%. So Make sure I understand. So we sold that a premium, basically? Yes, exactly. So the premium was above the was above the Right, okay. So there's a way the premium works that we got handed the million. Tom enjoys and then we only have to pay back. I was going to say, you thought it was more. Yes. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I understood that. Thank so you. there's, um, it's either one or the other. I'll show you this. There's um, <laughs> a bid, bid, uh, bid disclosure. I'm just going to tell you how much thing. I'm okay signing these now. I just needed that question answered. Yeah, that was a big question. <laughs>
We're back in session. Uh, before we took a break, Mark had a question regarding the um, bonds that are issued. So, Mark, do you want to clarify? Statement? Yes, please. So, um, the bonds that were issued um, feature an interest rate of 4% uh, on the sheets, and we heard the presentation and are very pleased that it came in at 1.06% roughly. Mm -hmm. um, the reason, so how, why is it 4% here and 1.06% there? The reality is we went in to borrow $6 million, and then these payments with the 4% premium are, in fact, what we will pay back. What happened is that in the, the bidding that took place, instead of giving us $6 million, as we requested, they paid us a premium. So they ended up paying us $6.9 million in total instead of the six for the same payment stream outbound. That's from our perspective. So we're signing documents that indicate this 4% payment, and we're going to see it, but the reality is because of the premium we raised, and I won't find the page, but $6.9 something million dollars in total. And it's a benefit to the people pushing that to, to, to people who want to buy it, and that's fine. But from the town's point of view, we collected $6.9 million instead of six for the same payment stream. Is that a reasonable summary, Bob? Yeah. Which reduces, which, in if, which, which makes it, in effect, a uh, 1%. Uh, yes. Okay. Interpolated so interest rate reduces the right. 1.0 whatever, whatever it is. I mean, it's just, it's just arithmetic. It's just yeah. money. Arithmetic. I'm pretty sure we lost everyone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Sorry. So I feel better about signing up. Mark, and we will uh, now have an economic, economic development update. So, Aaron, thank you very much. Hi, I'm Aaron Schaefer. I'm the economic development director. I don't know if I can use you anymore. I've been here seven months now. Um, and tonight, I'm just doing a quick overview of what our town goals are of the economic development action plan in town and what we've been doing for the last six months um, with our team. So I did want to start with the basics because I've been getting some questions from the public about what is economic development? What does that actually mean? And how does it all relate uh, back to planning and land use? And how, how does this all work for what I'm doing? So um, I just want to start here with land use planning is a really complex field. And Julie and I work together hand in hand in our office, as uh, the planning director here, um, to really talk about all the things that you see outside. We look at transportation, we look at open space, we look at housing, and economic development kind of does all of those things. Um, uh, and we work all across um, those topic areas. So we're interconnected and planning is overlapping. Um, and I also wanted to touch base on what a master plan is. So a lot of towns have master plans, a lot of cities have master plans, some are older than others. Um, but what I do want to say about a master plan is that it's really an overarching public policy that helps us plan for the future, helps us really direct what a community's physical form may look like over time. So it's not meant to be something that's a, a plan as a directive for maybe one to two years. We're really looking at a much, much larger time horizon, 20 years, 10 to 20 years, 30 years, and it's constantly being updated in a different kind of way, which I will um, get to in a minute. So master plan really helps communities um, look at the overall framework for future policy decisions, and a master plan also provides guidance to how we use our land over time and how we set priorities for maintaining infrastructure. And then there's this public process, uh, which we're really good at, um, and I really enjoy. Um, and that's really important for all of us to just be engaged in community so in the town of Reading, we have a master plan. And then, again, those four topic areas, we have staff that look at all four of those areas, and we all overlap and work across departments together. And this master plan is um, Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 40. One section D is a little wonky there. But anyway, um, we have a master plan in accordance with um, the state law. And then the state also gives us extra points for grants and funding opportunities. Um, for the town, if we have supplemental plans, my points are here. So our supplemental plans are, we have a housing production plan in town. We also have an economic development plan, which is my, what my um, field is and what I'm here to do. 
And then I, we also have an open space plan. And all of these plans, all these supplemental plans, get updated all the time. And so um, what I mean by updated is we have many, many different types of plans. And they all relate to each other under each one of these headings here. It's all the kind of master plan. And we have these supplemental plans over time that all inform one another and all update one another in a lot of ways. And they all talk to each other across all these things as well. It's a little complicated, um, but more or less, um, our plans are really complicated. So I've been getting this question a lot. What is local economic development? And at the very basic core, economic development is the process of creating and sustaining wealth. I'm going to sit with that for a second process of creating and sustaining wealth. And we have a number of ways that we talk about wealth, and we have a number of different tools and methods of measuring wealth. These are not all of the tools um, and measurements that we use, just some of many, many, many different types of um, points uh, of data. And I want to point out here that there are lots of different um, ways of displaying this data. And I'm taking a look at different um, dashboards and things to as a tool and mechanism for marketing our town um, to talk about some of some of these items here, some of these data points. Um, so I've I've been doing some exploratory work there looking at different dashboards that might help us communicate a little bit more about our town. And the reason why this dashboard is important is for taxpayers to understand what their tax dollars are going, for example, but also for developers who may be looking at this town and may want to purchase property or for new businesses who want to spreading, they may they need to know what their what our market is to be able to sell to you. And so that's why that information is important. So in the town of Reading, we have um, this planning approach and economic development approach. We want to keep downtown vital. We want to preserve what's important, and we always want to be up for opportunities, not for the plan really We want to be ready, um, because change is inevitable, and we want to be well positioned for the type of change that we want to see in the future. So we have, um, of all the plans that I just showed you, and talking about the master plan, um, my work is really around the town's economic development and action plan that takes us through 2022. And for the next few slides, I'm going to talk about each one of these six bullet points. Um, again, a reminder of what each one of these goals are and then how we are going to get, how we are working toward those goals. So when we talk about economic development, we're talking about economic development as a whole, um, question mark. What we're really talking about is, are these four areas. Um, these are, all the purple areas that you see here are residential zones, and all the green areas that you see here are open space places, places of open space and wetlands and things like that. And so when we talk about economic development, priority development areas, or develop, uh, potential development, we're really talking about downtown, South Main Street, um, the New Crossing Road, the Ash Street area, Walker's Brook, what we call West and East. And we kind of coined this term. Um, this is called the Eastern Gateway. I like to say that this area is the other side of the downtown bow tie um, at our most miserable whatever intersection <laughs> with the train is that bow tie knot. So anyway, I just like to think about it graphically that way. So we're really talking about, you know, future current and future opportunities in these areas for development, for commercial, retail, and housing, um, a mix of uses. So our first economic development goal is to adopt local policies and practices to facilitate mixed use development in transit accessible areas. And we're seeing a lot of development currently, um, actually since 2009, uh, in, in the private sector side, um, that for example, the Met um, and other, and the post office and other developments um, where density is a bit higher, um, particularly around um, the train station in downtown. And so some key policy initiatives 
We're updating our parking management strategy, which we'll uh, be hearing more about tonight. We're advocating for more transportation options, especially across departments um, with the state um, and others um, through a number of different ways. Um, better bus network, for example, those kinds of things. Um, Julie and Andrew had worked on a South Main Street mixed use zoning clarification this year. And then we expanded the 40 hour Smart Growth District in 2017. I believe it started in 2009, is that correct? Um, which was started in 2009. The 40 hour Smart Growth District is really awesome. It's an overlay district and it's basically a policy that allows for mixed use development close to transit oriented areas and also um, provides for workforce housing which is a really important component um, of housing. Workforce housing is a really important component of um, economic development. People who are working like me in town, or um, teachers, or uh, firefighters, or coffee shop owners, everyone needs a place to live, and um, workforce housing is a really important component. Um, we have signed a community compact, which is really helpful for us. Um, that's at the state level, and that gives us um, further granting opportunities and grinding points when we apply for grants or now part of the community contact. Basically, we're meeting standards that are in alignment um, with the governor's policies and initiatives, and that puts us as a town in good standing with the state. And we've also adopted a complete streets policy, um, which also helps us with uh, infrastructure improvements and funding. Um, on an annual basis, and it also helps us um, make uh, multi-modal infrastructure improvements, so uh, bike access and bus access and sidewalk improvements and those kinds of things. So our next goal is to enhance walkability and connectivity um, within and between these priority development areas. So this is kind of a wonky term, but basically, what we're trying to say is we want to connect downtown to Walker's Brook and even allow people to uh, have access to the lake or, or from Wakefield to downtown Reading. Um, we do have some bikers who take their life in their hands. <laughs> um, so we really want to connect people. We have um, workers at Frame Corporation who are walking along the tracks, for example which is really also scary. And so we want to make sure we're connecting people to places um, for jobs and enjoying. <coughs> and so there are lots of different uh, initiatives that we're currently working on. Uh, we have Mass Dot Road uh, Diet Trial on South uh, Main Street and North Main Street um, that a huge team here is working on. Um, and that is coming up soon. We'll hear about that more. I don't know what our public meeting dates are, but we'll hear about that. Um, we have a comprehensive corridor redesign of Walker's Brook Drive, a new crossing road that's ongoing. We've hired Green International um, to do a comprehensive analysis, which I'll get into. Actually, it's actually right here. Um, Walker's, we are taking a look at traffic and safety improvements and intersection improvements and all sorts of um, kinds of things. So those orange circles are all those different intersections that we're taking a look at. And those big red lines are all areas um, areas that we're taking a look at. So that's really important for us as we think about creating and enhancing walkability and connectivity to really understand the dynamics of our traffic and access. Our third goal is to brand and market priority redevelopment areas to attract interest from developers, commercial establishments, and potential customers. I'm really excited to say that the town of Reading has made it to North Shore Magazine this month. Yay! Um, so that's really exciting that we're hitting lifestyle magazines and the Boston Globe and our local paper and we're on Facebook. Um, so it's really exciting. And I do want to say that every day we're marketing ourselves. If you're a resident, you're marketing your town, your staff, employee of the town for marketing ourselves as well through our daily practice so and then we also have a really nice website that i'm continuously updating and um, that's also getting a lot of traction so that's helpful we've also been holding networking events 
and we have launched this Reimagine Reading Downtown Initiative, which is really exciting. Um, the town has received a grant from the state. Um, again, those grants are really important, and the standing of the state is really important um, in a number of different ways. And two, so we have started this, actually we've been working on this initiative since I started um, with our team to create an organization and really a partnership downtown. And this downtown initiative is to create supplemental services or to provide supplemental services, things like um, helping the Rotary make Wall Street Fair even bigger, for example, or maybe we get into music festivals, or maybe we provide small business loans and all sorts of initiatives that the town otherwise couldn't because we're a town entity. So it's creating a nonprofit organization to provide supplemental services where the town has a role, but really a supporting role and is a partner and one company. So that's been an exciting um, process with property owners and organizations all collaborating um, together. So we do have a panel discussion coming up where um, on the 27th at the public library at 630 where um, the working group will be meeting and listening to different panels from other communities. And that's something that we've been doing by other communities and we have already gone through the experience of creating an organization and doing other initiatives to learn from others. So that's exciting. And then I attend a lot of um, regional networking events and um, state level events uh, to make sure that I'm connecting and reaching out and marketing the town. And then also making sure that I'm learning from others and providing information back to them as well. And so I'm excited about uh, supporting local businesses. I have also served as a liaison between the businesses and town. Um, I walk around town a lot to the individual businesses um, to kind of give you an idea. I've had over 150 meetings in the last six months with businesses. Um, and then uh, regarding downtown parking, we had a downtown parking initiative survey, I should say, um, where Andrew and I walked door to door and we spoke to 55 businesses in person. Um, and then I followed up many, many times with different property owners um, on one-on-ones and then present in front of um, the Rotary and the Chamber and many other organizations, the Downtown Retailers Collaborative. And that's really an ongoing relationship and discussion with individuals and business owners as well and organizations. So um, that's kind of what support looks like. It's really face to face. And then I do want to advertise here that we just started thurs thur Thursdays, I say we, but it's really the Downtown Retailers Collaborative that we're all together. Um, so I highly encourage all of you to shop on Thursdays uh, because our small businesses are open late. They're open until 8 o'clock. And that's a big initiative um, that the businesses are really trying to work on. And with a district management organization in the future, I anticipate that this Downtown Retailers Collaborative could have staff potentially to help them really create a buzz even bigger than Facebook by really going door to door and creating flyers and really creating a buzz and creating a huge event around this kind of thing. And you've seen this in other towns. You'll see like music and like a restaurant week and restaurants opening and having specialty things and shopping. So with all those things put together um, with that this could, um, this initiative could really take off. So we're excited about that. And um, again, we, as the town, can advertise, but we have limits too. We have to be impartial. And so a uh, district management organization can really help leverage advertising and marketing in really specific ways that the town otherwise can't do. So from a development side, or this, yeah, really from a development side, um, another goal is to promote public and private partnerships and collaboration to maximize redevelopment potential. And what that means is really taking a look at key properties, specifically in the Eastern Gateway, um, that we've talked about earlier. I wish I had on a map, sorry. Um, but it's really on the border of Wakefield that we're talking about, Ash Street, Walker's Grove area, where we have current commercial industrial um, uses that are there to stay. We have really interesting um, industrial buildings as well. And oftentimes when we think about redesign or redevelopment, this, there's this concept of just kind of taking away what's there and we're starting with a clean slate. And that's not the approach that we are taking. Um, and I think that's really important. Um, for years, 
Jane's been speaking with private property owners of those properties, and I have too for the time that I've been here, and we continue to do so um, to really talk about what the possibilities are going to be from the private side. Um, so one of the exciting things is that uh, the town hired Gamble Associates through a grant, a housing choice grant that we qualified for. It's highly competitive. Um, and we were able to hire Gamble Associates, which is a design firm. And they were able to help us really think through what could potentially be using currently existing buildings. This is a historic building that RMLD currently occupies. And just imagine that this could be a park that's not the parking lot and programmed in a different way that would serve as another hub, almost a village, almost a kind of a second destination within the downtown um, that really connects and speaks to downtown but also provides an amenity in and of itself to the Ash Street neighborhood. And we're thinking art center, some sort of public, some sort of public fun, creative, int interesting thing here, whatever that may be. Um, and this is just one of many, many components in that design plan and more information is online on the economic development web page. And our last goal is to build community and activate the public realm of the downtown Reading through cultural economic development and placemaking initiatives. And placemaking initiatives are really awesome. Um, there are so many different kinds of things and placemaking is this, kind of, sometimes you see this like pop-up breweries or pop-up I don't know, like parklets and where parking spaces are taking over to extend the sidewalk. You've seen this in other towns. Um, uh, public art, mural festivals, lots of other towns in our region do this. And we're excited to really be thinking about that. Um, one of our staff planners is working on an art box program that will hopefully be unveiled soon um, in the springtime. Um, and we're hoping that our district management organization in the near future will be able to do a lot of this stuff, fundraising and um, support, providing staff support and really uh, leveraging different kinds of events and things for downtown. So we are continuing to, so what the town can do is that I'm actually providing staff support to organizations in town that are doing creative things, like working with the Rotary and Wall Street Fair this year. Um, we, as a town, do downtown trick or treat. We also support the Rotary, um, sorry, the Chamber through the holiday lights, programming, um, and those kinds of things. So we're actively marketing the town and trying to create a buzz, and we're really looking forward to those things. And the work continues. I'm going to stop there, and if you have any questions, please let me know. And I apologize, I didn't put my contact information up there, but I do have cards if you have any questions and follow up. And all of this information will be online, and there's lots and lots more detail on the economic development website. Thank you. Any questions you, from the board? I have, I have one. Um, I thought I heard you say that the North and South Main Street uh, road diet tests were going to go through. Um, was it, did I hear that correctly? Yeah. Yeah. So that that's um, great. I'd be, uh, I'm very happy to hear that those will be tested and, and that will help walkability if they work out. Um, as, as far as the, um, I, I, I forget what's referred to now, the, the area where RMLD is and Ash Street and um, yeah, the East so Gate, Eastern Gateway. Gateway. Eastern That's Gateway, area. yeah, yeah. Right, so right. this is the Eastern Gateway, and we're kind of dubbing this small triangle as the yard. So, so two, two things on, two thoughts on that. I liked, I very much liked the, uh, cons the consultant, I thought, did a, a good job of envisioning what that could be. Um, Per our earlier discussion about RMLD and they move them moving forward with things, maybe not with con after consulting with us, are, are you reaching out to RMLD because they're a property owner in that area, and and or if you're not, would you be willing to um, reach out to RMLD to include them in the conversation? Because I I understand um, the at the last pre at the consultant's presentation. <coughs> Um, that they, uh, some of it was a surprise to them. So, um, that's not no, correct. That's not no, um, I can clarify that. Um, when 
before we, Gamble even started, mm -hmm. we've had lots and lots of conversations with RMLD, trying to work collaboratively with them on future planning for what they envision. Um, I think what you're recalling is when we show some of our images, mm -hmm. it's very forward thinking. Mm -hmm. And so we talk about transforming a historic building into an art center as if we could snap our fingers and it would happen tomorrow. Right. But we would love that. Yeah. But, um, but if we do this in planning. We, 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 we imagine things, but it's really a long process. And I think the comment that was made from the RMLD <coughs> executive director the, day we, the night we did the presentation was, okay, we're programming that area for parking. Mm -hmm. And that's what's happening now. Mm -hmm. We're looking into the future, and w we knew that that was going on, and she had been part of a dialogue going back to before we even finished the um, Economic Development Action Plan in 2015. Mm -hmm. We talked about this. So I'm going back five, six, seven years of discussion. Um, so yeah, it's not a surprise. She was just making the comment, you know, we're under construction with this parking lot. Well, yeah, she just spent a million dollars on the parking lot. Mm -hmm. She commented right. on that. Mm -hmm. But but that's okay because we it's are okay. looking really into the future. Okay, thanks. Other questions from the board? Yeah. Not uh, really a, a question so much as a as a comment. I think you can. Seven months, you can call yourself new, but you I feel like you've done more than seven months worth of work, <laughs> so thanks you. for, you clearly hit the ground running, so thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay. Here, Jane, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Public comment. Is there public comment? I don't know. Oh, okay. Okay, just checking. <laughs> All right, Hello. thank you. Great. All right, uh, so next up we will have an update from the Economic See Development Committee Subcommittee regarding oh, the yeah. new EDC. Yes, please. Okay. Um, thanks. So, um, Andy and I, as the subcommittee focused on the Economic Development Committee, presented um, back in, I think, October, November timeframe and shared with you kind of a vision that we had. Um, that was based upon reviewing other communities that had an economic development committee type organization. We conducted a number of interviews. We reviewed missions and structures. Um, and you know, interestingly, there are not many communities that are fortunate enough to have someone like Aaron working full and, and other members of the team, um, but Aaron working full time in support of economic development. So we're somewhat unique in that way, not completely, but but somewhat. Um, which is wonderful and ecstatic to have that. Based on some of those discussions, we put together a structure in some ways similar to the Permanent Building Committee, um, including giving them some guardrails to work within, not overly specifying um, what they should do and how they should do it, but enough of some guardrails to work within and kind of figure out their, their path and their mission to figure out how to do it, which is similar to how the Permanent Building Committee kind of found their way um, as well. Uh, the board asked us to out do some more outreach, particularly to town staff, um, as well as boards and committees. Uh, we did that, and then to come back with a recommendation on the structure. And the document that you have on page 41, 41. is really the summary of, of, of where we are to the point where that we wanted to bring it to the entire board as a draft policy. Um, ask that you you review it and if all makes sense then to approve it and then to start doing some recruiting um, this is similar in in terms of mission to what we presented last time but we did um, have I think two or three meetings um, with Aaron Jean Bob um, in attendance kind of talking through what some of the things were and trying to to make sure it was not something that would obstruct but in fact would very much complement and supplement in a lot of ways. But also to bring in this notion of an ongoing business professional and community perspective on things that we thought could really be, be helpful and really help us in economic development. So this is the structure, um, the way it looks right now. Uh, we suggested there would be seven members, three-year terms, in a way that um, there would be uh, two two to three per year that would be coming up for, for reappointment. And we also put in a suggestion, um, if you look at the last three bullet points, on um, what type of folks should get consideration in terms of being brought on to the, 
onto the group. So we talked specifically about individuals with expertise and experience in commercial real estate, financing, development, marketing, real estate law, civil engineering, architecture, housing diversity, or other areas of expertise and experience which would assist the town in attracting businesses to the community and otherwise carrying out the mission of the committee. We also wanted to make sure we had some owners of running businesses or landlords, as well as residents who support the purpose and objectives of the EDC. These are guidelines where I guess the VASC would be giving consideration to members representing some of these interests. And then, the, and then the board. And then the board, sorry, the VASC would use this in, in recruiting and, and making recommendations to the full board. And is this modeled on, I'm sorry, um, is this modeled on um, the structure of the permanent building committee? Or so was that, a comp that was a topic at went up? So it's not modeled on that per se in terms of structure and mission. That really came from looking at other towns and how they're okay. doing economic development. But the notion of bringing outside expertise um, that is professional as well as community, that's, that is closer to the, the permanent building committee structure. And then the other thing that I think is similar is in thinking about how it would work. And we, um, there were a few sentences in particular that I think we modified to make it very helpful. Um, the first bullet point, provide ongoing business professional community perspective and dialogue on townwide um, economic development issues. And number two, strengthen resources and capabilities of the town working collaboratively with town staff and other relevant boards and committees <coughs> on economic development issues. This is not meant to be an obstructor, it's a facilitator in bringing in other opinions and opportunities to help make this thing go forward. Yeah, to, to, just to make, clear, make it clear when Mark said bring in outside um, professionals. He didn't mean outside of Reading. He, <laughs> residents. I think um, this was started up uh, when, when I was chair of the board, the previous board, and um, there used to be an EDC. There's a lot of talent in Reading that I think is untapped and that we can use um, to our benefit. So um, that's that was sort of the germ that started this and as Mark described um, we hope to get those people on this sort of an EDC and um, uh, really so, I, I have a question for you yeah. in, in your researches it sounds like you compared uh, you look to what other towns were doing so in those other communities that um, either have EDCs or an economic development director do they have both so they have specific people either in the planning department or with the title that has economic development in it mm -hmm. and a group like this. Okay. In the case of, if I could, just in the case of, of Lexington, um, there is an economic development director um, who, uh, she described to me, um, kind of leans on this group for um, a lot of stuff uh, in terms of what comes in as well as vetting different things and looking at different opportunities. So they're looking at an area called Hartwell Ave and this group in Lexington actually is very helpful in helping them think about what they want to do with Hartwell Ave and how to do it and talking, knowing some of the people that could get involved in big development projects and they're able to bring that to the table. Um, I just, the, the reason I ask is because as I read, I, I that sounds great. I'm not seeing that here. So when I read this, and you know, I see a lot of overlap with the presentation we just saw. Um, and so whatever collaborative relationship that looks like, um, I want to make sure that we don't have volunteers sort of treading on staff, right? Because the, when we look at our new building, which has been a huge success in town and very valuable to the town, um, it's a different skill set that they are providing, right? Um, um, and here... Largely. Right, here I, here I worry that there might be some overlap with the staff, and I know you've met, so if I'm, you know, if, if this has been addressed, then fine, but I, I just want to be sensitive to that because whatever whoever joins this committee, um, our economic development director does not report to this committee. No. Correct. No. Um, and I think that needs to be clear. I think it needs to be clear, you know, that whatever decision, when decisions are being made, <coughs> that there is a clear path of hierarchy as far as who is making those determinations. Um, so those are my only flags on this. Did you, I, I don't know, Vanessa, if you caught um, the 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 part that said the committee shall not have any regulatory enforcement or implementation role. 
I did. I saw that. It, it just, you know, when we talk about, you know, if we look at bullet three that the, of the first one, maintain an ongoing dialogue with business owners and owners of major properties on a proactive basis in order to to understand how the town can work with them to achieve their plans. Mm -hmm. I, I think that was like slide six. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if I, it's also a matter of making sure we don't have a full-time staff member and a group of um, volunteers working in parallel, right? We don't, we don't want redundancies here either. We talked specifically about that issue. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and that was not the intent, that we'd have redundancies, that we'd have two different people essentially doing the same thing, one mm -hmm. that's kind of town staff and one that's that's part of this group. Right. Um, but there are other relationships that might want to be developed, or it may be that there there aren't. They're all being handled you know, sufficiently. A, a lot of this was thinking about where can we add. So again, look to the first bullet at the bottom. Individuals with expertise and experience in commercial real estate, financing, development, marketing, real estate law, civil engineering, architecture, housing diversity, or other areas of expertise and experience. So this is meant to tap the community resources beyond what any one person could possibly have and provide that as, as a resource to move in the town ahead. That, that's the goal of the makeup. That, that's the suggestion that we want to provide. John? I have many questions. I know this will be shocking. <laughs> um, so, uh, the first one that I would just want to be clear on what I thought I heard you say, um, because this is this has the potential. Based on, I agree with Vanessa. You got to be really careful here. I mean, we've got the luxury, and I call it a luxury because, as you discover, there's not a lot of towns that have the opportunity to have an economic development director, um, particularly one that is, you know, active and visible everywhere in the community. So <clears throat> did you, as a subcommittee, meet with, I mean, did you, did, did you kind of run all of this through the ringer with um, Aaron and Jean and, and, and Andrew? Uh, well, Andrew wasn't here. When, when we started this work. Um, but we did meet twice with um, um, both the economic de development director and um, the assistant town manager and the town manager. She's here, she can hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Aaron. You can Aaron. Hi, Aaron, <laughs> wherever you are. Um, uh, yeah, and, and we, you know, we, um, we took into account their feedback uh, to the best of our ability. Um, and, and really the idea, again, is is for this to be an additional resource to the town um, that will uh, first um, that will really mesh hopefully what you know will the idea is to get them to mesh and to synergize with town hall's effort um, in in development around town I mean, it's just as I'm reading this, it says, become a valuable resource to prospective businesses, current businesses, town staff, and town boards and committees through mm -hmm. providing formalized feedback in the form of recommendations and suggestions on implementation of initiatives designed to enhance economic development. I mean, again, that, that just feels like our economic development director. Uh, didn't we just hear so I, that I, I, and presentation? I, I, I mean, I, I've almost identical. I've been a identical. big proponent of having an, a new EDC. I just, I'm worried about the way it is written right now and that there's just a lot of overlap with our full-time staff member. Mm -hmm. So I guess I'm asking, you know, we're already, we're, you know, a little behind and we still have a long um, downtown parking agenda. Um, so what I recommend is if, and, and John and Anna, I don't know how you feel, um, if we could ask you to sort of revisit um, I see, I see too much overlap now, and that, that makes me a little uncomfortable approving as is. And I don't quite know what the answer is, Bob. If it's helpful, if individual board mem members want to send me comments, and then I can direct them to the subcommittee at a post right meeting. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I do circuit. think that yeah. it needs work. I think it's a, you know, I, think I get yeah. where you're going. I, I understand what you're trying to do, and, and I applaud the, the concept of it, but I think it needs work. I do have one remaining question that, you know, I do want to clarify, and it has to do with the last three bullet points, the composition of the committee. 
You're talking about seven people. You've identified eight areas of expertise already, mm. and then you want to add Reading residents who support the concept but don't aren't particularly, you know, adept at any of that stuff. Um, and then we want business owners and commercial property owners, many of some of which live in Reading, but many don't. And of course, we don't want to go outside. You have to be a resident. We don't want to run off that reservation. Yeah. No. Um, because that would be right. inappropriate. Yeah. But I would say this: that be mindful of the fact that the last economic development committee was dissolved in this room because a large majority of the present members of that economic development committee indicated bullet one and I'm sure you've all seen the letter it was a letter from one of their members that says hey these are who we need this is who we have. We don't have one of those people. Therefore, you know, we're probably going to be struggling to make get traction here. I'm paraphrasing all of this, of mm -hmm. course, but the letter's available as part of a packet. Um, so I would just put the word of caution out. I love that bullet one, um, and it's got eight plus categories. You're only going to have seven um, slots on your committee, and then you're looking for, you know, a couple of people who are civilians, shall we say, um, from all of those other eight categories who you'd like to include. I would just suggest to you that if you're going to build a committee like this, whether it's seven or whether it's nine, I, you know, I don't know the right number, but I think you should somehow, from its inception, um, have some limitations to people who do not fit bullet one. Well, I actually agree with you. Um, Are we writing this down? Sorry. <laughs> wow. Uh, I do it all the time. Um, I agree with John. Uh, I think I there's a couple things. Um, from what I've seen, committees that are large have a really hard time meeting quorum. It's just a lot of people to try and schedule to get in the same room. So one way that we could do this is have it be, um, and I'm throwing numbers out here, but a five-member committee with three associates, four associates, um, so that the expertise that's there, the, they're the actual members, whether it be full or associate. Um, the owner of running businesses, I mean, I think that locks us down because many of the local businesses are not running residents. So the, the relationship is still there, the chamber is still there, they could still participate, but maybe we don't necessarily need them as members. Um, and as far as residents goes, you know, that's sort of already there because all of them have to be residents. So there, that bullet three is by default captured in bullet one. Um, um, just to clarify, I think that I like the five member, uh, three associate idea, um, especially for quorum. Um, but all the uh, individuals that we mentioned in these three bullets, th the sentence above says that, that we shall give consideration to members that represent uh, the following interests. It's not saying that we have to have um, one of each of these. It, it's just that we'd like to get, you know, this is who we will can give consideration to. Um, we don't expect, obviously, if it's a seven member board and there's more than seven types of people here listed, um, um, it's, we don't, the, our, the expectation was but that we wouldn't have identified there. there rightly. Or, yeah. Or would be a great fit for this community. Right. Yeah, but I mean, I think would, I would the, goal, the goal is not to get each and every one. Um, it, it, the goal is to, that would be the pool that we could select from. So, Anne, I, I saw your hand. Um, so, a possible fix that might address con concerns in terms of the membership. Um, it could be, um, you know, bullet A or bullet B, who are bullet C residents. So, individuals with this expertise or owners of Reading businesses or landlords. And then for categories A and B, mm -hmm. who are residents who support the purpose and objectives of the EDC. 
Um, and then I, um, I do have some concerns about redundancies, particularly following on the heels of Aaron's presentation. Um, but I, I think I think there there could be certainly ways um, for the economic development committee to contribute to economic development in town and to work. Um, to supplement and complement the work of the economic development di director, um, and so I would just I would agree with you know if you could just give it one more. Look. I don't know if you if you framed if you framed a question to Aaron, um, but if you haven't, I would invite you to do so. You know where are the gaps um, uh, where you feel like uh, this committee could help um, complement and supplement. Uh, the work that your department is already doing. Um, you know, where is your, you know, you have, you know, the department has limited bandwidth. Everyone, no one has right. infinite resources. Right. Um, where, where could our community resources support um, and and uh, amplify this work? Um, so, one of the things that we did when, when talking to people from other locations mm -hmm. was to kind of ask them what the structure was and how it worked in in some sense um you know where do some where do some of the the goals of planning come from and, and what's the structure is it kind of is it staff driven is it outside consultant driven is it board driven mm -hmm. and that varies uh, by community and it varies by resources that you have available um, and one of the things i was struck by in particular and, and some former members of the of our EDC mentioned to me too the notion of when you're going out looking for some of the really big players it's played very differently um, and insiders get it and others don't and um, I was approached by a couple of people specifically talking about whether they're uh, specific tax incentive financing kinds of activities or relationships or things like that um, that happen through experience and expertise and having done it before and, and again, I think we, we applaud the fact that the town has invested you know, all mm -hmm. into the structure that we have here. Mm -hmm. We also want to make sure that as we're looking for some strategic initiatives and some really big stuff, that we have access to the expertise of some residents who have worked in this area and know this stuff and can bring it to bear. And the question is, how do you, how do you harness that? To me, the, the PBC <coughs> has done a really nice job of that. And where I think there probably was concern about overlap initially in terms of what they were doing versus, let's say, the facilities department, it's turned into quite a partnership. Mm -hmm. And I think what I observed specifically when the PBC shared feedback on the buildings, the yellow-green kind of structure, mm -hmm. um, it was in cooperation with facilities. And I think facilities appreciated some of the feedback that, that they received. And when I talked about kind of being similar to PBC, I think that's the right kind of relationship that would exist here. It's not a reporting relationship, but it's bringing in a different kind of expertise. And frankly, it's it's um, it's allowing the town to kind of achieve the best that it can achieve as a result of that. I think that you know, that presentation from PBC I thought was outstanding. Um, and my guess is, if you talk to Joe in facilities, he'd say, oh, "Yeah, it was awesome. It was yeah. really helpful. We learned a bunch of stuff." I think the way I see it, and, and then you know, we'll take final comments and then and then move on. But um, as I see it, you know, let's say tomorrow we have a new EDC and it is staffed with these phenomenal people in Bullet One with all this fantastic experience. What's the first thing they're going to do? In a practical, from a practical perspective, presumably they'd meet with our economic development director so that they understand what she's been working on and, and sort of the big picture of the town. Then what actions do they take? What is expected of them? And I, I would work from there because it, it seems like you're, you're working from the ground up as opposed to kind of creating this, this from scratch. And, and clearly a lot of work has gone into it, but what are they going to do when they meet? Like what's their first agenda look like? Do you want me to answer or do you want me to just take that into consideration? I mean, I <laughs> Please take it under consideration. <laughs> yeah, we, we that's what I thought you were saying, we but I wasn't sure. We so that's, I mean, I guess that's, you know, if you ask for feedback, there, there's, my, there's my ask. 
Okay. I, I don't know if the two of you have anything else to add. <laughs> I have nothing else to add. So okay. I'd, I'd also just like to make the pitch that I think there's a lot of development going on in town and um, residents um, have varying opinions, of course, on, on this type of development and where Reading is going um, and the desire to maintain a small town, maintain a small town feel to Reading. And I think creating an EDC like this um, allows some of that um, sediment to uh, a venue for some of that sediment. Mm -hmm. Residents could come to their, their meetings, um, provide ideas, input, uh, things like that. So it's just nice, it would be another tool, and, but something resident really resident driven. Okay. Okay, just last quick comment. Yeah. Two plus mem past members of the EDC shared with us that one of the reasons why it had to end is because it, it, it didn't seem to have a role. It didn't seem to be able to bring things forward that would come under consideration. It was more kind of a, okay, you know, maybe you can help with this. Maybe you can help organize X, Y, Z. Not helping to really bring stuff into play. And they were encouraging of us in terms of, of what we would do and, and create. But the one proviso was they have to have a role. They have to have a voice. And so long as they have a voice, it's really a great thing to do. But if they're not going to have a voice, you don't need it. Right. Well, I think the difference with the, with the former ADC versus what, what we're discussing now is that there was not a full-time dedicated staff member to this topic. And so I think that, that changes the dynamic a little bit. But I, I definitely hear your point. All right. So um, with that, we will wrap up this topic. Um, we can discuss when this comes back after you've had it. So I thought, could we act on Bob's suggestion that we would uh, sure. all send comments, comments? Oh, yes. To okay. Thank you. Yes. Great. Um, we will say preferably not this week, but maybe by next week. Well, this week we, we couldn't. We, I don't think we could receive it until we next meet in open meeting because that'd right. be a serial well, well, violation well, of well, open meeting well, law. Yeah, that's okay. Do you want comments? If do you want us to um, send written comments that simply state what we've said in the meeting already, or or, or only if we have more to add? I would think only if we have more to add. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. Yeah. Would Bob restate them. I, I, yeah. and sometimes things are yeah. Send people out. Yeah. Okay. Great. So everyone will send comments to Bob. Thank you okay. both very much for your work yeah. on that. Um, thank you both for your presentation and for hanging with us. <laughs> All right. So moving on, we have a presentation on downtown parking. So is this Julie? Okay. <laughs> I guess I'll stay. I guess I'll stay. Hi. Hello. Hey, Julie. Thank you. Um, I'll just make a couple of opening remarks. Um, this is meant to be a workshop. This is not meant to be um, a lecture. Staff has uh, you know, taken the board's comments from last fall quite seriously about get to work. We don't want to wait. So we met almost every week since you met in the fall um, and really had a lot of very long discussions about <coughs> lots of topics that you don't have to hear about today. And this is what the culmination of all our work was. This is a very complicated area. Um, it's very easy to blow up the current rules and start from scratch. And then as we had discussions, we started to understand why the patchwork was built. What about this? What about that? What about this? You're going to go through the same thing. So I'd encourage you all to try to take a step back and stay there and think philosophically. If we had an opportunity to start this all over, and let's not worry about the exceptions we already think we need to make, let's just think philosophically, what are we trying to accomplish here? I think, I think that'll be helpful, because we went through kind of a life cycle of that and, and sort of lost track a little bit along the way, because there were so many exceptions, and then said, wait a minute, we're right back where we started. So this is challenging. Um, and Julie is going to have a lot of discussion tonight, really kind of putting thoughts out there for future discussion. <coughs> um, the board does not and, and should not make any decisions tonight other than giving advice to town staff as to what do you like, what do you not like, what things haven't we covered that you'd like us to cover. 
and any other com comments like that. Um, we have a draft schedule for your next two meetings to have a public hearing. It's not essential. But if you think in terms of a July implementation, as Julie will show you, some of that is time, very timely. You don't have to do anything for July. You could just extend the six months for another six months if you're not satisfied as a board. And obviously there's election in the middle of this which complicated things. Um, it's more important that you get it right than to get it fast. However, you're never going to get it perfectly right in your Jimmy Cormier, the former police chief, uh, said it took him 10 years to realize he's never going to fix downtown parking. He always thought it was something mathematically you could fix. And he said after 10 years, he finally admitted to me, Bob, I finally realized I can't accomplish this. It's not possible. As businesses change hands and the uses change hands, the parking needs change. So I, I ask you to do the best you can to step above that and just think, what is the philosophy of Reading for its downtown and for parking for all the different users. <coughs> Thanks, Bob. Okay. Julie, before you jump in, Bob and I, in preparation for this meeting, had a, had a conversation about this. And I said, well, Bob, what's the expectation of the board? Mm -hmm. um, and Bob, this is where Bob said, you know, this is it's a brainstorming session. It's meant to provide feedback. One of the things we ran into at our last one where we had the parking presentation was putting forth ideas for immediate implementation. Right? And that is not the goal of today's meeting. The goal here is to hear, look at the big picture, um, not to solve for individual situations or problems that we have right now. Uh, because that will probably set us back. So with that, I hand it over to you. Thank you. Um, so this presentation is meant to be holistic. I apologize in advance. It's a lot of information. Um, I have a few handouts I want to give you. They're all going to be shown throughout the presentation but they're helpful to have in person so um, the first one is actually the full comprehensive package of changes um, that you know is based is a scenario based on the stated philosophy from the last time that um, I presented to you in October which I'll I'll reiterate um, the second one is a map that I made that kind of shows the ge geographies and the terminology so you can follow what I'm proposing and what I'm saying tonight um, and then the second map is um, like the overall outcome um, visually represented. These were, are these the same ones that were in black and white in our packet? They are, yes, they are. In black and white, they make no sense. Um, it was fun trying to puzzle them out. So just as a reminder, um, this is a cross-disciplinary staff effort. We have staff here um, in the back of the room um, representing the management side, um, planning, economic development. The DPW is here, um, the police department's here. We are pretty much a united front when it comes to these recommendations, and that was you know, something that we worked really hard at, like Bob mentioned, every week for the last few months. We've met and we've really hammered out the details, and we've come to you know some recommendations that we all can support. Um, sources used for this presentation include maps and data. Um, these are the same sources as last time, but one key thing that's added this time is we did a parking survey, um, downtown parking survey, in the months of November and December, and we got some really good feedback from downtown businesses, and I'll get a little bit into that um, into the presentation. Um, so tonight's presentation, I'll do a little recap of the October presentation. I'll do go over highlights from the downtown parking survey, um, and then I'll go through the opportunities that I see for the downtown parking system. Um, and they're broken into three kind of categories. The first is some surgical fixes to discrete problems. Um, so just to summarize what that means, um, essentially things, actions that can be taken with or without like a system-wide overhaul, but that will have, um, we think, positive outcomes on the system. So if you don't do a big change, you could do some small things. Um, and then, of course, the system-wide modifications, which is the handout that I gave you with the yellow top. Um, and then some key elements and homework. And the, by homework, I mean some things to think about before our next conversation. Um, and then I'll finish with what our request, the request of the Parking Traffic Transportation Task, task Force um, to you tonight. For tonight? Yeah. Could you back up to that one? For sure. A second? Can you tell me what a discrete problem is compared to... Yeah, so something um, else, another problem. 
So for example, there are some cars that are parking overnight in the senior center parking lot. Um, it's creating some problems for enforcement and for snow removal. And so one of the discrete problems that we can fix is removing the overnight exemptions in our public lots. So um, you'd make it okay? Well, that you know, that's up for, up for discussion, but yeah. And, and we have. I'll make it not okay. Right now. It's not okay now. Make it not okay, yes. Yeah, it is a lot. It is okay now. We want to make it not okay. Right, that's right. Yes, okay. Um, so just to recap where we were in October, I showed you this map. This is our current downtown parking system with all the regulations. Um, in the downtown, which is approximately 50 acres, 25 city blocks, or one half mile end to end, we have two dozen ways of regulating parking. The user experience of that is frustrating. Um, I won't go through all of this again unless you want me to. Um, no. That's the general summary. Um, and then we talked last time about you know the guiding philosophy that the staff group is using sort of as we you know look at what changes we want to make. And the three tenets of the philosophy are expanding access, leveling the permit playing field, and empowering versus penalizing users. And then related to those the um, tenets of the philosophy, there are various opportunities. And I will say that. Um, these opportunities that I presented back in October have largely stayed the same and we've really just like probed into them and fleshed them out a bit further. So nothing has drastically changed in that regard. Um, and back in October, um, you agreed on no changes for January 1st, but you nicely gave us all six months to kind of study the problem further and come back to you in the interim as I'm doing right now with some suggestions. We, um, during that time, you know, promised to gather some additional data to do this study. Um, this is just a list of some of the things that we said we would, we would um, gather. We, and we did put together a downtown parking survey to ask many of these questions. Um, and I should note, actually, so if you see red stars next to anything, that's because um, these were recommendations of the 2018 Nelson Nygaard consultant study. Um, so none of these things were, like, dreamed up overnight or arrived to us um, by divine intervention. <laughs> um, you know, these are all based on industry practice and um, a lot so, of work with consulting. So I understand this is what you set out to do when you left here the last That's time. That's correct. Okay, yes. we're still recapping. I'm so, yes. Okay. All right, so now we're not recapping anymore. Um, this is the downtown parking survey. So survey highlights, it was open for about a month between November and December. It was distributed um, via email, website, and in person. Um, and Aaron mentioned earlier tonight that staff spoke in person with 55 businesses. Um, we had a total of 52 responses. The responses were all from business and property owners, managers, and employees. Um, broken down, that result was actually responses from 47 individual businesses because there were a few um, who we heard from like an employee and a and an owner or something like that um, So we estimate there are about hundred and forty businesses downtown and this represents about 30% of downtown businesses responding to our survey um, To briefly go through the data um, So we asked you know how many employees do you have per business and we gave them ranges to you know report back um, the, the the red highlights here with the arrows are what I'm really going to touch upon. Um, the I included medians and averages just for interest's sake. Um, but for employees per business, 70% of respondents have fewer than 10 employees. Um, employees during busiest time of operation, 50% of respondents have fewer than four at their busiest time. Um, and the typical length of the employee shift, um, we had 75% of respondents with a typical shift of eight or more hours. Julie, could you go back to this slide? I just had a question. Um, so for employees per business, why are there two medians and two averages? Um, so it's a range. We had um, the businesses on the survey, we asked the questions in terms of a range. So we got, rep they reported back in terms of a range. Okay. So can you, I know that you've got a lot of ground to cover, so I'll be very brief. Um, when you send, can we get this? We obviously got a photocopy transmitted to us, mm -hmm. which means there's no color in it when mm -hmm. um, it blurs badly. Mm -hmm. 
So can we get this electronically so we can put it up on a big screen at home and spend some time with it? Sure, I would love it if you did That'd that. That'd be great. <laughs> 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 Mrs. Walsley okay with that? Oh yeah, she loves this stuff. Do you really want to do this in your free time? Be my guest. Um, we got a lot of rooms. This is it. <laughs> so yeah, please stop me if anything doesn't make sense or have a question or comment. Um, I'm trying to go quickly because I know it's late. Um, so. With regards to the employee permit program, 71% um, of respondents are familiar with the program, but less than 50% of respondents use it. So we asked, you know, if you don't use it, why? Um, and we had some responses from people who didn't know about it, didn't need it, um, <coughs> couldn't get any permits. Um, and then other feedback we got was the program's too expensive, the spaces aren't guaranteed, and people don't want to walk with stuff. Um, so. Um, Broken down a little further, you know, I was looking at so how many employee permits were purchased versus how many are needed, and I had to break the data down a little bit because um, fewer than 50% of respondents actually use the program. So the first column of data, um, my mouse will work. Can you yep. see it? Yeah, right here um, is skewed, you know, low because 50% of respondents don't use it. So then I, I adjusted it a bit, took the, took those out, and re calibrated it um, and what's interesting here is that it shows you know what's purchased um, by the participants is actually in similar to what's needed by the participants um, by, by everyone um, and then the takeaway from this is that you know if we cap the number of permits per business between five and ten we would cover a large portion of the businesses who responded to this survey um, would do we actually have enough spaces if all that many were sold? So that's a really good question, um, and I'm going to get into that a little bit later. Um, we we have some proposed ways of expanding the number of okay. permits and number of spaces downtown. We probably don't have enough currently. Um, so if you sold all those, I mean, your takeaway is, you know, five to ten for businesses if you sold them all. Right. Well, I, I mean... I think that you know because we're hearing from businesses who weren't able to get any permits because the permits were all sold out. That just on its face is an indication that we need to provide more. Um, yeah. Yeah. Got it. Okay. All right. I know that's a true statement. So um, we asked. Um, people who took the survey to tell us how they think the program should be improved or expanded um, or whether they think it should be improved and expanded and if so how and so 87% of respondents do think we need to improve it. Um, the feedback um, that's in red are things that we think we're actually kind of covering with our proposed solutions. The blue feedback um, are things that are definitely up for consideration could be discussed maybe also Resolved, and then we have a few comments that we, um, I have here in black that you know build a parking garage um, or designate one space per business. Um, I'm not sure that those are things that the town you know could do or would want to do. Um, but so, should I go through them? These this people? list came out of your survey. Yes. Okay, and you've categorized them in the three ways. You I described. categorized them. Okay, yeah. got it. Um, so there are a lot of a lot of the feedback that we got. We we feel like we've we're in some way sort of covering or addressing with our proposed changes. Um, can you read this all? Yeah, it's, it's not too small. Yeah, it's okay, good. all right. Should I move on? Mm -hmm. Okay. Go. Um, so where do employees park? And it's important to note that less than fifty percent of our or fifty percent of our respondents don't use the program. Um, however, 45% of respondents still use the public lots and the public on-street spaces. So they're not officially in the employee permit program, but they're still parking in public parking lots and on, on the street. So um, we asked, you know, with or without the employee permit, where are the employees parking? And this is a lot of information on one side, maybe a little bit too small. Um, but I highlighted in red some of the... Um, interesting the things that I thought were interesting about the data um, as it relates to what I'm proposing later um, so for example Woburn Street which is the second or the, the third line down here um, a decent number of respondents park on Woburn Street and 
Woburn Street is one of the areas that we're looking to expand employee parking to. Um, Julie, the, um, the first one, just mm -hmm. off-street parking on private property, does that imply that they're leasing a spot from somebody? Um, a lot of them have private parking lots or, ha or are leasing, yes. Not to be confused with leasing public spaces. Right, right. it's a private arrangement. So there yeah. can't be very many that have their own parking lots. There are a decent amount of businesses downtown with their own parking lots, actually. Um, a little more than I more some than I would have thought. the business, so you wouldn't yeah. have noticed. No, I and I do know that some of them have got a couple of spots in the back, and that's mm -hmm. kind of how they deal with. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's a two-person business, that's how they deal with it. Right. Um, <coughs> right. So we're counting everything. Mm -hmm. Every every piece of hot top is really in the in the middle of this when you talk about private lots and things like mm -hmm. that. If you identified the amount of, I mean, you've identified how many people mm -hmm. respond by using this list. <clears throat> Do we know about how many of those spaces are really there? So, we counted them? I know um, that the survey a couple of years ago did some counting. Yeah, so the, the um, consultant went out and um, <coughs> counted some spaces and they're shown on the maps. It's very small. Um, <laughs> Um, th there is some question in my mind about accuracy of that, of, um, but it is a piece of homework that I have assigned to staff and you'll see further on in this presentation to really kind of verify what we have on the ground. Um, Yeah, I, I do think that's the really the only answer. You can't yeah, and look at a map and count them. Right. We would right. have a discussion about a street and then which side was actually marked the spaces and which wasn't, and we couldn't even agree amongst ourselves which I, one look. Yeah, I don't, you know, I, I, it's just a question. Yeah. Right. It, it was mm -hmm. just, I, I just, you know, didn't know where we were on that continuum. Because yeah. it's kind of, you know, in some ways, on any given day, I mean, you literally are looking for that one spot that's somewhere right. within reasonable walking distance. Right. That's going on. And some people are making up spots, mm -hmm. as no. we've also discovered the hard way. It's definitely, definitely true. Um, I do have some gross numbers based on the, um, gross totals based on the numbers that were provided by the consultant um, to give like kind of a, an idea of how many spaces we have and they're, they're on the maps and I'll show them in a minute. But are we ready to talk about opportunities? So we're sorry. ready, okay. sure. <laughs> so um, the first set of opportunities again are what I consider the surgical <coughs> fixes to the discrete problems. So things that can be done with or without like a system-wide overhaul. Um, the first one is the leasing program. Um, we've talked about just getting rid of it. So the town currently leases 58 um, public spaces um, to individuals who pay, um, I don't remember off the top of my head how much. Is it 30? Yeah, I was going to say 360 bucks a year. So yeah, that, that, that drives. Um, but it is essentially the privatization of public space. And so those, and those spaces are not available for any other user type at any other time. So they're either used by the person who's leased them or they're not used at all. Um, and we across the board think that we could take those 58 spaces and add them into the parking supply, um, you know, based on where they're located would be how they're regulated based on my map, which is coming. Um, but that would be something that you could do. We could add them back into the parking supply so anyone could use them. Do you have any questions about that? I do. Are they leased only to businesses? Or um, could it be individuals? Dave? Yeah, businesses only. Business is only. Thank you. Um, but not assigned, just leased, right? So if they would actually, they have a very specific So spot. they have a, like a they name on their spot. spot? It's numbered for them, it's numbered for that person. Got and um, like Julie said, when, if that business is closed, it's, 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 it's a leased spot. Nobody else can park there. It, it's, it's for a very specific uh, business, that one spot, that number, and there's a matching parking permit that goes on their car for that spot. 
Is that only the area on Vine by the train tracks? Or are there other leased spots as well? So there are a few spaces on High Street, um, 41, I think that's High Street. And then there are some spaces in the Brandy Court parking lot and some spaces on Harnden Street. Yes, hi. Okay. Um, Thank you. So the second um, discrete problem that could be fixed is the resident community access sticker. And there's two parts to this. Um, Can you remind us what the community access sticker is? Sure, yeah. So the community access sticker is a, um, basically a resident permit that um, anyone in an area that has a resident regulation on their street frontage can get a free one. Um, and then they're available town-wide to people um, you probably could speak a little bit more about this. Like, where there are restrictions for the tennis courts on, is that on Bancroft? Yeah, I think that's the only one I can remember. Okay. Can you think so of the third area? It's, there's um, some, I believe, on um, Bancroft Ave, but Julie's talking about more of the down, most of the downtown area, around um, private houses that are right in the downtown where it's heavily regulated, heavily regulated. The only spot I can think of outside of town would be in, um, down with tennis courts on Bancroft Ave. There is a residence Unfortunately, uh, there are certain parts of the street there. Yeah, there's two blocks that run in yeah. front of the tennis courts up to the ball field. Yeah. And, yeah. So um, to clarify, those people are allowed to get a special sticker. They're allowed to park where it says two-hour parking unless with a resident permit. So it's usually resident only between you know 6 a.m. and 10:30 a.m. Um, and what what we what we're finding is that. Um, it's actually kind of a loophole in the system where anyone who lives in town can buy one and park all day downtown and come uh. to work. Because it's only it's restricted resident only yeah. 6 to 10.30, so no one but a resident can park there. And then after that, there's no restriction, so they can stay all day. Um, so the extent to which it's actually serving the downtown resident population is, is a little unknown. Um, I did check with the police department, and there are 70 free community access stickers given out um, or that were given out last year which is like a third of a percent of the population so it's not you know a huge number of people who are taking advantage of the free option um, but it it should be noted and I think this was discussed back in December I wasn't at the meeting but you know there are a number of big multifamily buildings coming downtown where you know all of those people that live in those buildings would technically be eligible to get a free resident sticker and then in theory, park anywhere, um, and r rather than you know separate those buildings out from the rest of the population, it might be something to consider just eliminating the free permit altogether. So, t for purposes of clarity, the mm -hmm. community access sticker has is is, is linked to the compost. So it is. you either right. you know if you, I forget what they cost fifteen or twenty five bucks. Well, there's just two stickers. There's the yeah. sticker there's, for yeah. The, there's the commuter sticker that allows you to park for the depot. Then, if you if you want to, you can just buy just a straight compost sticker to allow you to get the compost, but doesn't give you the permission to park in those areas of downtown. We, we separate them. You got separated them um, last year, wasn't it, Bob? Yeah. Like, well, yeah, but that compost sticker gives you resident parking. No. No. Separated them. So the sticker that says resident parking and compost that it, it just expired. That, so there's one that says resident. If you paid 150, that gives you compost and the resident exactly. parking sticker. And there's a compost only sticker that just allows you access to sticker, and that's 25 dollars. Okay, got so it. There's two separate stickers. All right. We did that in the fall. And so the other piece of this um, is similar to like what's already been done, um, but do it. All together, just unbundle the two and have a commuter permit and a compost center permit. Um, and that's something that actually I think should be considered maybe in the future. It's not really a, a thing for right now. Didn't you and just say you already separate. did that? Well, we said the two stickers are separate. Okay, yes. so that's already But done. there's a piece that's still together, no? Yes. So right yeah. now, yeah. the way we have it set up is we have, there's two permit options. You can have both on one sticker or you can have just compost. So this would make it so that there's a compost sticker and a parking sticker and you have to buy them separately. And you have two stickers on your car. With right? the, with the um, 
depot sticker be the same as a resident parking sticker? So those be separate. So this well? is something that we need to dig in mm -hmm. to a little further. I really shouldn't have put it on this slide. Um, no, it's, I think it's glad that you because I do have it on a future slide where I say future. Oh. <laughs> Let's talk about this in the future. Um, but no, I think it's good, especially in light of the conversation we had last yeah. month about how to handle yeah. handle the sticker issue. So thank you for right. Being um, we will look into it more and come back to you with a little more information about about this. Um, and then the I, I think one of the points is the community access sticker is an old term, and it used to mean two things. What you really have now is a compost access sticker and a train station parking sticker. Great. And if you do eliminate all those other you know three things, that's really the two things that are left. So again, blow it up, see what happens. Yep. Right, right now is the commuter <laughs> permit, or is, our, is the um, secret that gets you access to the uh, the train station depot also the yes. same that would that you would put if you were going to be parking on one of these um, adjacent streets that are that say resident only between the hours of six and ten thirty. Is that the same sticker? Yes. So yeah. currently the it's sticker the that sticker. gives you permission to park at the train station is a resident. I we we call it a resident sticker. I know that's mm -hmm. um, basically gives you permission to use the compost, park at the train station, or park in these regulated areas that are um, that are in the downtown area. Yes. Got it. Um. Should we move on to the next mm -hmm. one? So the senior center lot um, right now is kind of a jumble of regulations. Um, I think there, I have some notes here. There are two lease spaces with no record of who leases them. There's an area for mind. senior center parking. <laughs> Love that. Um, well, that doesn't mean that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, what kind of that one, Dave? No idea. It just means that um, signs got put up. Right. We They were part of our, our um, um, inventory, and they, there's no record of anybody ever leasing them. So. The senior center, what you were talking about, correct me if I'm wrong, Julie, if I'm stuck on the other house here. No. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of signs up in the senior center lot that actually aren't, we can't regulate. They were put up at some point, we're not sure why, and they're actually not in the parking rules and regulations. That's something we've tried to talk about. There's, all, there's, there's a variety of uses in there, and most of them have actually nothing to do with the senior center. So that's something we're going to propose. Snow well, plows, use snow plows. And it affects the, um, yeah. you know, it affects the DPW to be able to plow out of there, too, yes. So, so instead of a jumble of regulations, the proposal is to just change it to senior center parking, which is similar to what we have. The town hall lot is town hall parking. Um, kind of just leave it at that. Um, and with regards to the town hall lot, um, allow public parking on Fridays and weekends. That's another sort of, um, that kind of adds to the supply. It's probably already happening. Um, but Not that much. No. So that's what I was going to ask. So allow is one thing. Encourage might be yeah. it's a whole different talking thing. about. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So I don't know if I'm talking about allow or encourage, to be honest. When we say allow, we're not, I'll be honest with you, if on Fridays and the weekends, we're not enforcing, we don't enforce that in the town hall lot. Right. People, we're encouraging people to park there, we let them, we've never enforced the parking there because it only benefits the downtown. Yeah, absolutely. No, I'm, I'm thinking of going even further and yeah. advertising. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, market. Come park here. Park. Right. Uh, Julie, just one comment on that, that slide on number two. Eliminate the free option. Um, would that mean uh, for houses, say, along Prescott, that um, front uh, permit parking only um, areas that are taken up by commuters? It would mean for everyone. So the free community access sticker would no longer be available to anyone. So you could still pay for one if you wanted. So if they have a house that's... Uh, they would have to pay for a parking sticker to park in front of their own house. Right, and so it's a little unclear the extent to which the free sticker is being given out to people like within the downtown area who have that situation. Um, it's I couldn't get like a breakdown of that information from the police department. Um, mm -hmm. I just got a gross number that it was 70 total that were given out. Um, mm -hmm. But are there is some utilization information that we have from our consultant that shows that those areas like maybe aren't super heavily utilized, um, mm -hmm. or if they are, it's like all day, which indicates maybe it's commuters. Um, yeah. Many of those resident, those residential buildings in 
the downtown um, that would be eligible for the free option have off-street parking. There's mm -hmm. one instance um, on Gold Street where that's not the case. Mm -hmm. um, and so we do on the map have the um, exemption for that property where they have nowhere else to park. Um, they right. could still get like a specific sticker for their property. Because um, where the sign says only yeah. so, right. a certain the person. Right. Yeah. yeah. So right behind the post office. You know, like kind of getting back to the philosophy um, of expanding access right. when we have areas that are resident only um, you know we're not we're limiting like the different types of users who can park there um, so in a sense if you agree to d do away with resident only areas downtown which I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself because we haven't gotten there yet but uh, getting rid of the free community access sticker may just be a moot point hmm. at that point um, but we can get come back to that and you know this is all food for thought for no decisions need to be made tonight one quick question on um overnight exemptions remove them all meaning there would not be overnight parking allowed is that right. correct that's right and how wait correct yeah Mark. so basically it's and jane tell my phone so you can go to one um <laughs> the senior sent a lot right now they, they've in the past they've always allowed overnight parking in there at eight o'clock they're supposed to move up the problem is at 8 a.m. the two-hour parking regulation kicks in, so technically you don't need to move up until 10 a.m. for us to enforce it. DPW cannot get in there and plow the lot when they need to, so they can't get their job done and plow the lot up correctly because it's all a mismatch of different parking spaces and everything. So the elimination of the overnight parking allows the DPW, when they're out there hitting the streets upon the streets, just put that on the road and knock that out and keep up with it as opposed to waiting until the place is almost open until the class going on until the meeting going on, and now they're scrambling to get the lot cleared. For a, for a building that's open. Got it. That would be is this just a few spots at, at the senior center, let's say? Is it just a few spots that are used that way, or is it really a bunch? The Brandy Court lot, uh, sorry, the Harney Street lot, which is on the Walgreens, is another is another building. And the Brandy Court lot, um, we're having issues now where people are parking overnight in there. Um, residents of uh, Haven Street um, apartment buildings are parking there, and they're actually parking in an employee spots overnight, and then they're moving the cars in the morning, and now the DPW has no chance to go down and clear those blocks either. So it's becoming, okay. it, again, it's becoming an issue where it never was in the past, but as the parking gets tighter and tighter, it's becoming more and more of an issue. And the concern, like I said, is safety-wise, they can't do their job. It's not their fault. It's because they can't get in there. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. that makes sense. So do you have any more questions? about this before I move on to the system-wide modifications. When you um, come back with this, mm -hmm. as you already are kind of saying, well, this is, you know, there are this many spots, you know, 50 whatever for this and 70 for that. Can you just add that to the yeah. slide, please, too? When, just when you come back. Definitely. Thanks. Um, okay. So this is like the appetizer. Um, <laughs> and now getting on to the entree of the night. Um, and I wanted to just start by sort of explaining the terminology that's used here. So one of your handouts says geographic terminology on the top. Um, and I just when we're talking about parking regulations and changes, it's helpful to define areas. Um, and um, so I'm attempting to use terms that are inoffensive. Um, the first thing is, you know, I drew a blue line along the railroad tracks and I'm considering like above the railroad tracks is the downtown north area and below the railroad tracks is the downtown south. Um, and then within the downtown north there are two sections. There's what I'm calling the inner core which is bounded by Woburn Street, Main Street, and um, High Street. Mm -hmm. And then the outer core which is you know these little like um, pink lines that kind of emanate one to two blocks up, you know, around the inner core. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'm referring to as the outer core. So. So we're all on the same page about the terms. Um, and then the methodology that was used for these changes, you know, in addition to the, you know, overarching guiding philosophy, um, the focus of the changes is in the downtown north. Um, I'm not proposing or we're not proposing any changes to the downtown south at this time. So south of the tracks, um, none of the regulations on those streets are proposed to change. Um, we wanted to let the mapping and the data tell the story, so we, you know, really looked a lot at the regulatory maps as well as the utilization data um, and the survey data to kind of like parse out, um, you know, where we thought we should go with this. Um, 
and then we capitalized on the existing framework so you know we are working within the existing regulated areas as much as possible um, so people who are you know used to or in businesses that are used to having regulations around them or in their vicinity um, that will still kind of be the same and then formalizing additional areas and spaces only as we think is might be necessary um, and you know many of these things like we see as small changes with a big impact of course to anyone who's acutely impacted by these changes you know they won't maybe seem like small changes um, <coughs> but when you look at the maps and what's proposed the things that we're proposing um, are in some ways you know just adjust this and shift this here and you know um, so it's a system-wide overhaul but it's a really kind of a series of small changes okay so um, this map we do not have a copy of. Um, this map just shows what's proposed for the inner core. Um, and it, it's really, you know, focused on the customer. So the goal with the inner core is to expand access to multiple different user types um, by having the regulations changed entirely to either public two hour or public 30 minute. Um, with the one exception of the Gould Street residence that doesn't have off street parking. Um, so getting back to um, you know one of the surgical fixes of abolishing the leasing program that means there are four spaces that are in the Brandy Court lot that would be added to the supply of you know public two hour or if we um, look at implementing payment kiosks in the lots you know maybe public four hour or public payment with no time limit um, but they're added to the supply of parking for you know of various user types um, and getting to your question John about like gross numbers I did add up you know the numbers that are on this map and within the inner core area which is um, you know recommended for public two hour public 30 minute there are thir 350 on street spaces and then there are about 175 spaces in the lots um, and the lots the, the recommendation for the public lots which is Brandy Court and CVS would be to have payment kiosks okay so we've got 500 roughly right we have 140 businesses with an average employee population of three to five I, I mean so I haven't gotten so to you start to do that yet. math right okay you got you have and we haven't opened a new business yet in postmark we haven't opened a new business yet in emark and we haven't opened a new business yet um, on mount sunoco okay so <laughs> <laughs> so you know I, I guess what i'm saying i'm not trying to give you a bad time no, i'm just no, trying to from a practical standpoint try to think this through mm -hmm. i mean we're already at a deficiency just for the employees well hold on, actually hold on. She said customers, and she hasn't gotten. I haven't gotten to the employees yet. She hasn't, she hasn't gotten customers. Yes, so the next slide. But wait, John, there's more. Oh, I, oh, I know. <laughs> there's there a is. lot more, actually. Um, no, but your point is well taken, and I will say, you know, of the 47 businesses that responded, over 50% of them don't use the employee permit program for various reasons. So we heard that some of them couldn't get permits, but many of them actually don't need it, um, and the median amount of spaces needed was you know one to four um the, or the, sorry the median amount of permits needed was one to four that's the 50th percentile number um so well i understand you know we may be looking at 140 businesses that all need 10 permits i think that's the really upper extreme um and we really might be falling somewhere somewhat less than that well I, you know i do understand that the rationale of eliminating the permitting system because it's not working Okay, I mean that's a fair thing to say. Would, would you agree with that? Too? That it's kind of the goal that it's set out to accomplish. You know, people are not utilizing it because it wasn't delivering what they had hoped for over time. Right. So, and I'm not being I, honestly. I'm not being cynical about any of this. I'm just trying to be practical mm -hmm. and think this through a little bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, it almost feels like. We've got to do something pretty dramatic, and I know that you've got 
some ideas that you're going to share with us in a minute, and I think that's great. And you can't fix this overnight, but we need to be, I think, need to be aggressive, you know, with potentially some radical solutions. So, because otherwise we're going to, we, you know, we hear that we just heard a fabulous presentation about economic development, and I, and I really am very encouraged by that. I, I, okay, just give me a second. I'm trying, I'm making a point here. I'm trying to understand, you're gonna, we're gonna hear from you tonight about intermediate or short term, you know, suggestions, is that right? I mean, like the ideal scenario would be they would work out great and they would be long term solutions, but like we can always try things and get more right. feedback and see what's working Good. and make adjustments and, you know, it's an iterative process. It doesn't have to be, and all or nothing or all right now and never again. So, Mark, go ahead. Just to, to clarify, so I know, I mean, John and I, I think we're both fixated on this notion of 500 spots, but I'm reading the slide, and this is probably your next slide coming. There are actually 1,400 spots, you're saying, right? So, um, that is on your printout, but it's not shown on the map here, because I didn't want to focus on entirely on the numbers that were collected by the consultant because I'm not sure, especially in the outskirts, like how accurate they really are. Okay. Um, right. So I'm really Let's focusing on the inner okay. core So area. 500 inner core customer parking spots. Yes. Yes. Um, and so to explain a little further about like what that really means, um, and I don't know how like visible it really is on the screen, but so the green, the, the areas that are highlighted in green right now, like along Haven Street here, are already public two-hour spaces. So what's changing really here is on Gould Street, there's some public two-hour and employee spaces, and the employee piece would be would be moved, and that would just, this area on Gould Street would become all public two-hour. And then these areas that are striped um, here, pink, that are resident only, those would be, you know, relocated, and that area would also become public two hours. So we wouldn't have resident-only parking downtown, and we wouldn't have employee parking right in that inner core. Um, if I could just add, and it, it appears you can't know for sure that a fair number of these spaces are being used to commute. Yes, trains. that's correct. Uh, so they're dead spaces in terms of being useful for the downtown. So many people, it seems that people are buying the resident community access permit from around town and driving in and parking in that resident only area right, you know, here along Sanborn Street or here along um, Green Street and commuting all day. So there are cars there all day and so that they're not contributing necessarily to our down, the vitality of our downtown businesses. Um, now there are, I'm sure, exceptions to that. I'm sure there are some residents downtown that are that are using those and you know that's something that we need to consider um, so now getting to the employee um, parking map so it's a little hard to read I apologize for that but the outer core area which is highlighted in pink here is where we're proposing for the to be employee parking and as you'll note like to the east of Main Street on Pleasant Street and Chapin Ave we didn't um, get this map uh, no, so I gave you the the total map, like where I put Got everything it. together. All right. These two I didn't give you. Um, so uh, employees are already parking in these areas, and they're it's called the outer core, but they still <coughs> are within that one half mile. Like the downtown end to end is a half a mile, and it really is just a few blocks. It's not necessarily like a huge distance. Employees are already parking there. Um, what? What I'm proposing here is to expand like along Woburn Street here where it's public two hour, the data shows that it's not very utilized. And th so those spaces could be additional employee parking spaces. Um, and then again, on Linden and Sanborn. So the street, you're talking about the street parking on Woburn mm -hmm. doesn't get utilized as often as you might think. Right, so we have data that shows that it really doesn't get a, at, at any given time during the day, four out of ten spaces are available. Um, and so from a parking uh, utilization standpoint, that's actually pretty low. Um, the target, you know, when we talk to consultants, they always want to target like that 80%. So you really want, you know, only two spaces available at any given time. So you have healthy turnover but healthy utilization. Um, <coughs> 
on this employee thing, can I just give you a little feedback that I've gotten from probably no less than a half a dozen businesses and maybe as many as 10 direct feedback on the fact that um, out in front of this building, we get signs that say, if you work for the town, you can park here all day. We didn't have that. Yeah? No, we don't. It says, it says two hour parking except for employees. Employee passes. That's, That's not the town stickers. employees, town hall employees. That's the things we sell for employees. It is. Yeah. That's good because I didn't yeah, understand that. And when I got that feedback, I went, that's worth raising. So let me, so let's yeah. say that out loud so that, might like that people who are, you know, misinterpreting what that is. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because the, the feedback that I got from these businesses was, why can't we park in front of our business? The town can park in front of its. So mm -hmm. that's really good to know. Yeah. Right. And, I'm, and I'm glad we're talking about this, you know, on TV and out in public. Because I think. I think a lot of people don't realize they don't stop to think of they it. see that sign and they don't realize what that really means and so yeah. I think this kind of comes back those are lease spots right uh, the ones right on Lowell Street out here yeah. no they're actually um, they're actually two hour or, or right employee right yeah all right day out in front of the building what are they public two hour parking or all day with an employee permit and the all day with employee permit is not the least no. guaranteed space. No. It's the other category of employee right. parking. And it's not where you get twenty dollars a month instead of thirty, and then that's you're that's at the whim of what space might be available. Ah, uh, I got it. Okay. I, I think a lot of people don't realize yeah. what, what all those things mean. And that's because there's because there's like so many. It's like exactly. a, it's yeah, a we have so many. About, right. So, yeah. There's so many different <coughs> regulations. Um, I mean, so this like does try to simplify that into saying this area is public two hour, this area is public two hour, or all day with employee permit. Um, and that's the piece I, I don't think I mentioned, but these spaces out here. Um, where I'm suggesting that employees park um, would also be public two hours. So if an employee is not parking there, it's, it still can be used by someone else. Right. Um, but it can't be used with a resident sticker anymore. Well, for all day parking, that's what we mean. right. And so the the area is impacted that's by that distinction. Right. And so there are some areas affected affected by that. Um, I think this is Shoot Street. Um, maybe not. Right here, where my cursor is, is like 11, shows 11 resident only between 6 and 10.30 um, a.m. spaces, and so those would become two hour or all day with employee permit spaces. Um, so we'd be, you know, relocating the employee, some of the employee parking, like a little bit to the outer core, but then also expanding the amount of spaces that are available um, and expanding the number of permits that are are issued um, and I do have some gross numbers on that so in the outer core I tallied that there might be about 360 spaces <coughs> all told. Um, and but those are numbers that we really need to um, outer core. Do, mm -hmm. do we have any idea and I know this is probably hard to quantify but how many people are buying the resident permit and parking in these spaces that say two hour or and the reason I ask is because you know, the the area that we're looking at, which is this dotted line, and, you know, sort of sort of stops at Mount Vernon. Um, but there are many on on the top side, and it goes a little wider on on the south of the train station. But there are there's a ripple effect here where if we take away, and I I love this map, but there's also a unintended consequence, which is that spread those commuters are going to park somewhere. Right. And they're going into all of these surrounding areas. Right. Yeah, and that, that's that's a really good point. Um, you know, all of these changes will have a ripple effect and will impact certain users more acutely than others. Um, I will say right now, you know, many, I was, I drove around this area recently to kind of like see, like if I were a commuter from any town, I could come and park on many of these streets which are totally unregulated and are like three blocks from the train. Mm -hmm. I get people yeah. from New Hampshire in my so, neighborhood. So to a certain degree, like that's going to happen. Um, I do think that the, the philosophy here is, or the goal here is to take the all day, people who need, want to park all day we're kind of remove them from the downtown core where we want to have turnover and we want to have spaces available for patrons of businesses. 
Um, but we're sort of pushing them out at the expense of the surrounding neighborhoods. But that could be happening today. It, pro it is happening. It is, it is happening, it is happening today, happening. right? So it's just going to make it, it's going to exacerbate it. I'm not saying right, that, that right, it yeah, should, no. it's just a consideration. That's correct. <coughs> um, and or um, have to consider creating more commuter spots outside of the inner core, or outside of the inner and outer core. Mm -hmm. So, so we, there are some like longer term solutions to the com commuter. Um, Scenarios such as you know having an employee shuttle program, sorry, a commuter shuttle program, mm -hmm. or looking at you know a kiosk for a commuter lot or something like that. Um, yeah, we don't want to discourage people from taking the train. Right. That's right. 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 That's right. Right. Um, do we know what the utilization is of the MBTA lot on a typical day? Um, I probably do have that. Is it high? It is well, full. Yeah, it's full. It's like 80 percent now because they technically own two lots, but Gene stole one of them. Yeah, so like if you look at the map here, I have the utilization maps from our consultant from 2018 and the um, MBTA lots are, you know, in the pink, which is 91 to 100 percent utilized. And that's, you know, that's right in line with only the top one is MBTA. This is the MBTA one. I understand that. Okay. Didn't know the town owned most of the parking. Right. So but yeah, so that's, pink. it's pink, you know, it's probably pink all day long. And then it goes to blue, which is 61 to 80 percent as you get towards the evening, which makes sense. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. So, yeah, so it's, people get it's very high utilization. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. We, I mean, as someone who used to, to use talk, those lots, sorry. when we went to talk to them, they have two lots. They were each used less than 50 percent. And so we explained if you just moved everyone to one, you don't have to maintain the other lot, and that's how it worked out. And um, that's again, that's for out of town people, to, or anyone that just wants to pay for a single day park the train station, not. Residents that park there on a regular basis. Right. So they have two lots. Do we they squat do. on one of them? Is that how we're doing? But legal. Oh, it's good. We have a license. Yeah. We signed with them. I like yeah. that. So that's not an easy solution. It's already what we take and what we can take. Kind Next. Of. Yeah. Is it? Um, mm -hmm. Always more. I think the the shuttling idea is a really strong one. That we you got to find a spot to shuttle from. Right. I mean, but the cost of running a every 30 minute shuttle in between those places yeah. is infinitely cheaper than some of the other parking solutions that could bring everybody in long term you know i mean a parking garage for example you got it's got its own challenges this yeah. this this commuting thing i mean mark I, I think this is a really good idea we just have to identify the spot Right. Yeah, I mean, I have some seas of parking in my mind, <laughs> underutilized seas of parking that I think about all the time as missed opportunities, um, but that's for future conversations. Cool. Um, so then I put these two things together, and that's a map you have in front of you. Mm -hmm. um, it's the customer employee parking map. Um, just, re you know, it really just recaps everything I've mentioned. Um, <laughs> And I hope that you'll study it and ask me any questions you have, you know, via Bob um, in the upcoming weeks. Um, and like, I, you know, when I drawing on the map as I did over and over many different times, like I really got intimate, intimately acquainted with, you know, so the people who park here are going to have to park over here, you know, like it's it's interesting, and I, I would it's an exercise I would encourage you all to to do. Um, so I, I have a question to follow on John's point, which is in the, if we're moving the employees to the outer core where there are approximately 360 spaces, but on any given day there are 400 employees parking? Right. Right what was that? Um, well, yeah, okay, yeah, because there's 150 businesses. All right. Um, so we'll, we'll try to get, um, well, so we'll get some more on the ground information about what, what spaces really are there um, and we can do a little more digging into the number of permits that we might need um, we can always you know this t the next time around find out if there are businesses who weren't able to get any you know and uh, do we need to add more we there are areas you know like I only highlighted in pink areas I thought were like um, to add 
to add to the supply or to formalize spaces in the <coughs> supply. I was thinking Green Street, Bolton Street, um, good all Sanford, there's 25 spaces there. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, there might be some opportunities along Elliott Street. Um, there might be some opportunities on Mount Vernon Street, places where, you know, commuters might already be parking or it wouldn't necessarily be a shock to the system for people who are living there. They might already have a lot of people parking on the street and we could formalize it in some way. Um, we, can, we can look at all that and try to align the number of permits with the number of spaces. Um, because there are also people that are going to be parking on those streets that are not just employees and the, that are there for any number of reasons. So right. of the 360, who knows how many might actually be available. Right. right. Do you have a sense um, what percentage of employees of downtown businesses are commuting to Reading by way of the train or bus? I think it's very There's, few. Yeah, very few. Very, very few. Yeah. Most people drive in a single occupancy vehicle to work downtown. Um, that's really a function of price and connectivity. Right. Regional connectivity as well. Right. Yeah, and the commuter rail is not cheap. Um, well, it's meant to get people to and from downtown Boston. Right. It's not really not meant for commuting. <laughs> That's right. So. Right. Um, and yeah, people and are not going to go through the, the the bus drill is crazy. Yeah. So yeah. If you try to get here on a bus from someplace, right. you're going to work somewhere right. else. All depends is on the where you're answer. To the, right. You yeah. know, that's what ends up happening. Um, We're trying to get a route that will actually go down Main Street mm. next to the mm. train. Mm. We're working on it because um, that, you know, especially That'd with the great. mixed use and housing coming along Main Street, that could be helpful. But okay. um, so, Vanessa, yeah. going to continue yeah. in this workshop. I just thing you're doing here, which is I, this has been very helpful uh, to better understand the problem. But I think it's pointing in a direction that if you're going to make this viable, there's only two things you can do. Um, and that is you find a, you know, a substantial um, parking place that you shuttle to and from, or you build a parking garage or two. I mean, you know, where this is pointed is, I think, this is just an opinion, <coughs> to one of those two bigger solutions. I realize in the short term you've got a lot of, you know, little fixes, and I applaud the work you guys are doing. Um, but Thanks, John. Andy? Yeah, Julie, first of all, uh, great job on the ma on these maps. They're, they really... Um, Very old school. A, a, ma a map is... You know, a picture is truly worth a thousand words, and and I am a fellow map geek. Um, much of my work. Name on this thing, Andy. Tell the truth. Yeah. Well, no, but at, at work, I I do this sort of stuff all the time, um, except it's hazardous waste, not not parking space. Um, so fortunately, Let's keep that separate. That is not this. So just a couple questions on the map. Um, I'd like to blow it up to 11 by 7, 17 for older people, um, but... 11 feet by 17 feet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Big screen that. TV. So are these numbers associated with uh, um, the various stretches of parking? Are they the number of parking spaces yes. in that spot, roughly? So yeah, so in some cases where they're formalized and easy to count, they are. In other areas... Yeah. Um, I'm not exactly sure why they were included because they're not formalized um, or regulated areas, but mm -hmm. um, we will be verifying these numbers to get a real sense of sure. what we're really talking about. But this is it gives us a general yeah. sense and we can yeah. sort of put, turn this around and, and play with it. Um, I, l I think it's time for you know Reading to go to this inner core idea being focused on um, um, the public parking for people that want to spend money downtown. So so I'm, I'm very much in, in favor of that. And and then and then having the employees park on the on the periphery. Um, I'd love to hear your ideas not not now but of where there are there are places that we could use for parking, especially to encourage train, um, train commuting on the train. 
Um, and uh, this is obviously this is a big problem in Reading that we need that we, that we need to resolve. And I think this is a a really big big step towards that. Mark. Um, a couple of quick things. One, um, John, I think you, you, you might be on to this notion of, you know, it, it requires some kind of a big solution in the macro sense, right? And maybe, I don't know if General Way can play into that or not, but we should think about it. The second issue, I think, is more of a micro issue, which is access. So even though we have the 350, 525 spots, one of the issues is how do you get to them? How do you know what's open or where and how? And I think we should just, again, I'm not trying to micromanage the process at all, but just thinking a little bit about what sorts of things could help in the access category. So certainly signage we started, that's, that's helpful. Um, what are the things can we do to help people find the spots that exist? That problem is going to continue mm -hmm. even if we get more spots. Right? You may, you'll, have, you'll change your go-tos. But at some point, you still need to figure out, okay, my, my go-tos don't work. Now where do I go next? What we don't want is people saying, I don't right. stop. Right. So just thinking a little bit, yep. I don't know, again, we can't be the first town to be experiencing no. this. <laughs> so there got to be some folks who have gone through it and probably spent a lot of money, and, mm -hmm. and maybe there are a couple of nuggets that come from that. You probably are already on top of them, and you're saving them for next month. That's what it looks like. But anyway. I have some information <laughs> about that. Um, I mean, we, you know about our ongoing wayfinding project that we've been working on for the last few years, and that the first phase of that was parking signage. Um, yep. So I think that's helped to some degree. Um, it could always probably be improved and added to. Um, there, you know, there are various technologies people use to find parking spaces that you know, we could make sure we're plugged into. There's education we can put on the website. We have maps that we, you know, give to businesses to help them help their customers know where to park the next time they come. If, you know, I mean, there are various yeah. ways we can do yeah. outreach and provide yeah. education and information um, about the system. I definitely think simplifying the system will go a long way, though. So if there isn't a space that, you know, a patron of a business can park in on Haven Street, they can go down and, you know, turn the corner and, the regulations are the same, and there might be a space there, right? So they haven't, you know, they don't, they don't turn the corner and see, oh, resident only, and then they have to go all the way down the street, and then the next street is, you know, employee only, or you know what I mean? So yep. Yep. I, I think <laughs> simplifying the system will go a long way. Yep. So can I suggest a couple of thoughts on, on the old school side? Sure. Back to the maps. Um, Relook the one ways a little bit. Say it again. Relook the one way streets mm -hmm. that flow to Haven in particular. Right. Um, because if that's the path you're taking and looking, you get to do the long loop, unless you right. get into Brandy Court, right? You get to go all the way down around and try to come back in and see what happens. So that, maybe there's something that's there. Second thing is if we're going to look at pay spots, especially in the bigger lots, mm -hmm. um, if it's kiosk structured, if there's a way to advertise how many spots are available. Mm -hmm. Like uh, real time, yeah. how many spaces are available? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I know that the assembly square yeah. New garages. parking garage. Garages. Yeah. Yeah. They, they go so far. There's even a red light and a green light at the spot to let you know if it's open. But yeah. most importantly, it just says, "Hey, there are 50 spots, or there are 500 spots, or there are zero spots." Yeah, that's good. Operative. Yeah. The parking garage. <laughs> yeah. Um, has, is there has there been an assessment of whether we have enough handicapped parking spots available in the downtown area? I have not personally done that assessment. Do you know from a DPW standpoint? I'm just curious if it's been raised. I know there was um, a community, uh, some community members who went around and created yeah. a map of all the right. handicapped parking locations in town, um, focused on the downtown area for a member of the community um, that needed van accessible parking. So yeah. if you know if we're going through this exercise, and that may be something that we can incorporate at this stage as well. Okay. Yeah, I I, I do recall <coughs> hearing about that, and I'm sure I can find yeah. the information about that. Um, thank you. Well, um, uh, just okay. Let's go with Anne first, yeah. and then Anne. Yeah. Oh yeah. Sorry. Um, so I I like that we're thinking about um, making it easier for customers and employees to park downtown. I'm the one you know concern and certain spillover effect is that but if we if we remove the um, the resident only parking then that's going 
that's going to discourage commuting on the on the train if if that if those spots are being utilized by com commuters um, that spill over from the from the depot parking lot. So I, I think we need to to think about that impact. Um, yeah. I think there, it may be worth to considering, and I, I, when I raised this earlier, you know, um, one of the struggles is that some of the side streets that don't have resident-only parking right now are fairly narrow. So when the snow comes and you have these out-of-towners or even people from within town that don't pop, that, that choose to park in the surrounding neighborhoods, people can't get out of their driveways because the snow banks come up too high. And there's someone parked directly opposite. So it's, it sounds like a minor thing, but this push out into the surrounding areas are, is going to have sort of a bigger effect than just, you know, the streets are, they're public streets, people can park there. Um, but if people can't get out of their driveways, you know, we're going to be hearing about it. Um, and I don't blame them. So mm -hmm. um, sort of an evaluation of what that might look like. Yeah. Dealing with it proactively as opposed to once people are stuck. John, uh, Andy. Uh, j just a, a, a small question. Under, under the purple line, public resident permit parking only, um, is that supposed to be 6.30 a.m. to 10.30 p.m.? No. no 6.30 a.m. to 10.30 I think okay. the goal of that regulation there is mm -hmm. actually to discourage commuters from parking there. But the loophole is people with a resident community access permit can park there because they're residents. Um, and then they can also stay because the regulations end after 1030 in the morning. Um, so, so, the, so people that park on Prescott, for example, along, you know, there's a long line of cars up and down Prescott, which to a certain extent is resident uh, permit only. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that my understanding was they were designed for residents to be able to drive and park and then commute. That's how it seems like it's working. Okay. So, so uh, I see. So, so uh, I guess that makes sense because then after 1030, if you haven't caught the train, and the spots are open, then anybody else can pop in. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, is one of the things that you're going to look at, or one of the things you could look at, the opportunity to lease more private spots or to make it available? So I'm thinking, I'm thinking Airbnb for cars, if you will. But the notion of the, you know, there are apps that are out there, Spot Hero and whatnot. But probably if we made some people aware that they could lease their spots, they might have interest, particularly if it's during the day. So. Just the commuter um, side of things. So you're talking about, I'm sorry, I'm not sure like what exactly you're suggesting. Like you're suggesting. driveway spot. Yeah. yeah. Oh. <laughs> Encouraging people okay. to. Simple term. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I mean, yeah, thank yeah. you. Cut to the chase, Mark. <laughs> Sort of like this. Oh my God! But <laughs> I've been in the government too long. <laughs> yeah. No. Are there opportunities? So you know, are private spots? Is there a way people might say, "Hey, yeah. if I could get X a month for leasing my spot, I yeah. might be interested." Yeah. Bring them to Beaver Road. I'll yeah. shuttle them. <laughs> hey. We found the location for the shuttle service. We got a big driveway. Um, okay. So I'm going to focus us back. This is third. So I actually haven't finished. Like, there's still more. Oh, there's. Uh, Wait, yeah. um, okay, John, go ahead. Well, before we leave this employee thing, right. I, I just need, need to leave you with a thought. Okay. And that is, if, I, if, I, if there's a new business at Rite Aid and I work there, and this morning, um, it's 8 o'clock and it's time to be at work, and I'm parked on Woburn Street, mm -hmm. and it's 16 mm -hmm. outside. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty long walk. Even if you're a young person, um, for me it's ridiculous. I mean, but uh, you, you see what I'm saying? Well, so you're talking about being parked on the far end of Woburn Street and walking all the way down to the end of Haven Street. Well, I, I guess what I'm saying to you is, you know, 
there's going to be new. There's going to be a new business or two in Rite Aid. There's going to be a new business or two in Postmark. There's going to be a new business. Forget where all these businesses we have already. That walk sounds like it's not so bad if it's 72 and it's blue sky and it's sunny. Okay. If it's 96 or 16, that really sucks making that walk. I'll tell you. And if it's winter and it's dark because you got out of work at five o'clock um i mean there's just i mean we got to think practically yeah. about it we, we're not going to get this solved overnight i'm just trying to say let's not lose sight of that practical outlook outlook of people walking to and from their jobs right it's not it's not a small thing it's big i mean I've lost it. the flip side of that is if 400 or 500 employees take up all the spots in the immediate downtown area. People aren't going to shop there, and then they're not going to be downtown. I, I, so, I get it. Yeah. You know, we have to. Yeah. You know. Mm. Uh, I mean, parts. I do think one of the things John brought up, like such as it being dark out and walking back to your car, that's something that you know we've talked about and that's baked into this document. Um, it's a consideration that the town will need to to make if we're talking about formalizing some parking on. Bolton Street or you know a little bit further out where it might be dark like we'll need to look into safety improvements um, pedestrian improvements to make sure that it's you know we're funneling people to you know a safe a safe place to, to park um, and with regards to walking yeah I mean it it's, we did hear from I think about 30% of the survey respondents that they would be okay with walking a maximum of 10 minutes um, most of the downtown is Less, much less than a 10 minute walk. Um, so some people would be okay with it and some people wouldn't. Um, right now, I think it's important to note that, like I mentioned before, um, the stretch of the, really the only stretch of employee parking that we would be moving that's like in the inner core is on Gold Street and we would be shifting it to Woburn Street. So all the other employee parking is already happening like a couple, one or two blocks out of the inner core. So it's not a, like I said, it's a small change. We think it will have a big impact because it will open up all those spaces on Gold Street for multiple user types. Um, but, you know, in that sense, I don't think the changes to the employee parking locations are that drastic. Um, but why don't we pause questions for the board to let Julie continue. Oh, and the other thing I should mention too mm -hmm. is that, you know, we did talk, one of the, the it's, it's in this document, which is the next slide, which this is the like scenario based on the state of philosophy that includes everything. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the things to consider is offering the employee permit for free. So, you know, incentivizing parking, you know, a couple blocks away by mm -hmm. allowing it for free, yeah. um, which, you know, will help with, you know, the, the, you know, desire to park really close maybe and, mm -hmm. and move their car every two hours or the, like jockeying and yeah. um, it's, you know, an acknowledgement that, you know, we're not allowing them in the inner core, but you know, it's it's something we can give back. Mm. It's just some yeah. that's food for thought. And yeah. the on this document, you know, I've highlighted a number of things, and some of them are the things that I consider like homework or things to think about for the next conversation. Um, which you know, there are decisions that you can make that are you know will will be really helpful, but won't necessarily make or break like the overall scheme of, of what's happening here. Yeah. And so the the offering the employee permits for free is one of those. Um, little aspects of this that um, to think about so um, this document is really just like putting everything in one place and talking about how the changes will impact the different user types um, and uh, on the first page there's a few some of the items have like stars next to them and they're defined on the, the, the back if you flip it over if you want to know more. So I more specifically define what I'm talking about for inner core and outer core. Um, awesome. Yes. I just want, first of all, great presentation, very helpful. Um, Still not done yet. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice all right. Friend. We're not going to get around right. while you're going. All right. Keep going. I'll so wait. The red text on here like translates nicely to the next page, um, 
which are key, the key elements of this, which are in black, and then some homework items, which are in red on this sheet and in red here. Um, so just things to think about, employee permit, fee or no fee, public lots, like if we use, if we do the paid parking, um, would we have a time limit or no time limit? And staff have opinions about all of these things, um, but they're, they're somewhat negotiable and won't, necess won't change like the overall way the system works too much, I don't think. Um, and then with regard to the resident only um, and town controlled commuter spaces, relocating them out of the downtown north, which is, you know, a little bit tied into that free resident community access permit as we talked about before. Um, homework items and then homework for staff. Um, so as we talked about the employee permit spaces, we would redistribute them from the inner core to the outer core um, and what we would do uh, from a staff standpoint is actually get the actual counts of spaces um, to inform the number of permits that we could provide and then you know f view it from the other angle like how many permits do we think we actually need. Um, determine where safety improvements would be needed um, and just determine like additional areas where we could formalize spaces and add them into the system. Um, and then, you know, if we agree that paid parking should be implemented in public lots, we, there's a lot more information we can provide related to that. So like the nuts and bolts of implementing the kiosks, um, establishing a parking benefit district, which is recommended by the industry. So anytime you're collecting money on a regular basis from parking, that's not just through enforcement, you can have a separate um, fund set up that is separate from the general fund and it can be used and go back into streetscape improvements, um, like a whole wide variety of things directly related to the downtown or the, the district that's defined. Um, for that, um, we always find that fees have to be limited to the expense, right? So is that not applicable here for parking? There's some different legislation that's um, related to the parking benefit district. And I, I went to a thing about it like two years ago, so I'm, I don't want to, I haven't looked at it recently, but I would get you that information. I, I do know in Lexington, they collect a lot of parking fees yes they do. and those fees are redirected into the downtown mm -hmm. I mean, it's not just to maintain the parking meters right. you know mm -hmm. or, the, or right. to keep the snow off the street I there's mean, that, a huge you range. look at that downtown and you know I mark you had reference to it I mean the thing is yeah it's popping right. and one of the reasons is they got money and the money mm -hmm. comes out of that parking I mean it's a it's a thing that is real and more than one place. Okay. And that would just be for the lots, it would not be meters on the street. Right. We're not proposing to meter the streets. We're proposing just to meter the lots. Um, and <coughs> there's different ways that that can happen and with different technologies that can be used that actually give enforcement and, and more capabilities and staff a lot more data. And you know, there's, it's, it's all that, that technology piece that's baked into it. There's a lot that can that can be derived from that and so many different ways you can adjust You giving that guy more tools? Um, I mean, he gives me three tickets a week, a month now. I mean, <laughs> slow him down, will you? Um, so. It's like Maybe a don't park illegally. No, it's, it's, <laughs> it's time and you know, I do get a little carried away talking sometimes. I don't so know. So you know, <laughs> run over that two hour thing, it's easy. And if you, it's it's even, like a even today. today. <laughs> I am a revenue source. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Julie. Go no, on. no, it's okay. If you park in the lots, they're four hours today, and there's no kiosk. There you go. Yeah, you must take advantage, but you still can. Um, <laughs> Nobody else heard that. <laughs> Uh, and then, with regards to the community access sticker, we would uh, like we would do more uh, data gathering and exploring the feasibility of like what the unbundling really means. Um, and then, another key thing that we haven't really talked about is the time frame for regulations. So, if we're talking about public two hour, what are we talking about? Ten to four, eight to six. You know, um, I have an opinion on that. Um, what we could dig into that a little more and. We, can see what's happening now, see when enforcement is taking place, see what we think makes sense with regards to our turnover and our businesses and our busy times. And, um, um, but that's something that, again, like if we limited it 10 to four, you know, and it's in front of uh, a resident, you know, they, they have flexibility in the morning and flexibility in the evening. They might come home from work at 4.30 and like, there's no, there's no regulation so they can park there. Um, so, so that's something that we need to talk about. So, 
And you're, you've been doing this request all night, which has been really nice. So. <laughs> um. Offering feedback. Yeah. That's that. So, so are, you, are you done officially now? I think so. Let me just make sure. Off? Oh, yes. Yes, I'm done. <laughs> okay, excellent. Uh, further questions from the board? I just have one comment. I, th I think the, the whole thing that, the, the thing that will really make this work or, or um, make it a success story, obviously all the work you've done and, um, but getting as many people as we can to that February 4th hearing. Um, because the, as, as long as residents and business owners feel that they have a voice in th this is a you know pretty um, radical change, I think for the better. Um, but they're much more likely to support it and go along with it if they feel they've had a voice in the in the process. So I have a question on, on logistics for this, right? So we technically have a hearing scheduled for the fourth. Um, presumably, given the extent of this overhaul, we would have extensive public input. Um, what would that, I mean? What would be the goal at the end of that hearing? Would it be for us to immediately vote? So, is this next round going to be the final new parking downtown, or is it just? And where I'm going with this is, is the hearing to primarily hear from the community, incorporate that feedback, and then try again? So, sort of what what are the next phases? Really up to the board. You know, we've thought about different options, but it's really up to you to determine what you, what else you need to know, and what else you need to hear from, and what you think about what you've heard. Um, you know, you've shared a lot of your thoughts tonight, but you really need to, you know, whether it's homework or whatever, think about it, because you know, we, we try to kind of keep you at the philosophical level, and the board did a pretty good job of that. It, I think to me the simplest, uh, the most important part is simplify it. It's just too hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. when you talk yeah. about publicizing parking, you know, you saw that first map with two dozen regulations. Yeah. We don't want to publicize that. Yeah. yeah. We we'll lose their mind. So it's got to be something that's easily <coughs> digestible by anyone. So let me ask a different question. Um, by when do you need this board to make a decision in order to implement whatever changes we have by July 1, if that um, is in you, fact You have a public hearing which required two weeks, two weeks notice, so it's already posted for 8.30 on the 4th. Okay. Um, the board can spend it from 8.30 to the rest of the meeting if it wishes and can continue the hearing to as many meetings as you need to. Obviously, you've got an election in the middle. Um, it, it really depends on what elements of these the board are interested in as to give you that answer on the time frame. Um, I would say from, from my, my perspective, the paid parking and the kiosks requires lead time. So honestly, I don't know if the board decided in February whether we can implement that in July. Um, I'm not sure. That's tight to, to buy, buy software, buy equipment, and, and install it. I don't know that that's even possible. Right. Um, so I think everything but that is doable. Mm -hmm. So in that scenario, um, would it remain where it is now, which is a four-hour, or would that lot all it's those lots also be simplified? Um, you could, you know, come to you with some suggestions and see where it goes. Um, and again, it, it's a it's a balance of two things. The board has to be comfortable. First of all, it's not perfect, as Jimmy Cormier said. You can't solve it. It's not an equation. Right. But given that. Are you comfortable with something making a change? And if you're not comfortable, there's no rush. We'd like to do something. There's a clear problem. Everyone agrees on that. Mm -hmm. The only way to fix the problem is by trying to solve it. Mm -hmm. um, but if there's just elements of this that are really sticking with the board or board members, then you just want to get it right. You want to be comfortable. All right. So. So, you know, I think a, a February time frame allows us to do pretty much everything you saw except for the paid parking on July 1st. Okay. So from a board perspective, so I, I'm pretty comfortable with what they've put forward. I understand, you know, there's a couple areas throughout the presentation and on the maps and, and this chart, which is very helpful, so thank you, um, that sort of need to be ironed out, time frames, things like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, but. And, and the kiosks obviously might not be a six-month implementation. It might be a year or longer, whatever that scenario looks like, if, if that's the direction we want to go. 
Um, for everything but the kiosks, what are the boards feeling on moving it forward um, with a more finalized plan to be presented for the February 4th hearing? Where we would then hear from the public and based on that feedback, we could determine that continue or determine next steps. Are there any major objections to anything that has been proposed mm -hmm. that then the staff could take more consideration on? I think one of the questions is if we do many of these things, back to your point, John, do we need a big, a bigger solution than is currently on the table? And if so, if we decide that that's the case, we're not going to resolve that on February 4th. Yep. So bigger solution meaning employee parking more or parking. effect on surrounding communities? No, uh, or more parks. physical parking spots in a somewhat, I don't want to say centralized, in a, in a single location. A large, a large group of spots. It could be general way, it could be a parking lot, it could be other shuttle sure service. Lands, shuttle yeah. service. So that, I mean, that, places. I don't, I mean, feel free to correct me if I'm wrong here, Julian Bob, but I don't see that as a July 1 implementation. <laughs> creating <laughs> land. So, <laughs> yeah. That? Right. Creating land. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, identifying, uh, uh, so I, I think, similar to the kiosk, I think you're on the right track for long term. I don't see that as immediate implementation. Now, we don't have, again, we don't have to move on this, but we could take the longer term kiosk and off-site parking lot discussion, make that ongoing, right? So that if that is the will of the board, then that's the direction we go in, but we still implement all of these other things in the meantime. Do you think or no. Yeah, we, my opinion, we might want to, um, instead of just kind of pushing it out to a, a date uncertain, mm -hmm. I would want to say, this is the longer term vision we're thinking of. Shorter term, we can implement these, let's do it. And then for this date, let's talk about these next ones. So we're Maybe that's get a presentation back on what could you do if you wanted to do a mm. parking lot. Maybe that's something we can prioritize at our February eighth brainstorming follow-up session. Right, okay, so the, so <laughs> are you suggesting on the fourth we would so on not the, resolve and continue, or that we would resolve what we can? On the well, and that's that's sort of the question before the fourth now. Yes, I think we should always resolve what we can when we can. <laughs> so let's do that on February 4th. Yeah, I think yeah. as long as we're thinking, <laughs> as we're thinking of the bigger solution, I think that's fine. I just don't want to kind of pretend that we resolve this and wash our hands. Right? Yeah. I know we're not going to do that. Right. I just don't want to have the feeling that we've done that. Yes, I don't think the conversation ends here. I think the conversation is how far we want to go to implement July 1st, and then we have to continue the conversation for everything that cannot be completed in that time frame. Andy? Right. I, I think that um, we don't. We haven't seen a final uh, plan yet, mm -hmm. and and Julie will have something like that for February fourth. Then there will be a public hearing, um, and I, I don't think that um, I, I don't think that we should act the same night as the public hearing. Um, I think that. We should listen to the public, sit with it, mm -hmm. and then the next time we meet, vote on it. But I, I think if you, in, in, for something like this that, that affects so many people, if you ask them to come give their opinion, um, Julie presents a plan, they pre present their opinion, and then we vote on it. We have some discussion, and we vote on it. Um, it, it could easily easily be too easily be perceived as um, we didn't really take full consideration of their well and uh, some their president thoughts. might come up with some brilliant I completely agree with that you gotta fine. hear from everybody mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. and then you have to then you have to sit and think and make yeah. you know make sure they they know that they were heard and that we well, it will only be seven short days away that we're in another meeting to make the decision. Yeah. Not that I'm counting or anything. And in the middle of that, we're going to have one on the 8th. How did that get booked? So it's okay, the okay. I'm just joking. Okay. All right, moving on. Gentlemen, all right. So, um, Julie, it sounds like what we're looking for is we will have the hearing on the 4th um, with sort of. Uh, well, let me ask a different question. Have we given you enough information or enough questions with our feedback to fill in some of the blanks that you were seeking guidance on? I think so. I mean, I didn't hear a lot of um, 
like negative or like don't do that or that's a terrible idea or like really strong reactions from you guys. Um, so I mean my plan would be to just keep progressing with you know what what we've started here and try to fill in some of the gaps on like the numbers of how many spaces. And, um, okay. um, so then the plan is we will have that with um, sort of maybe a condensed version of this presentation if we can. Yeah. Uh, and then we will hear from the public. We will have any additional conversation that the board wishes. Um, and then we will continue hearing to the 11th for vote. And will we have, if appropriate, will we have time. a sort of written proposal in our packet that we can review uh, for the fourth? Yes, I would suggest yeah. that. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I think that's yeah. like I think it'll be necessary because the public will want it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think they yeah. need to know what they're talking about, yeah. right? What, are the, yeah. what proposals mm -hmm. they're responding yeah. to. Yeah. So I'd say as, as, as soon as you're comfortable with that, but I would say not later than Thursday the 30th, but the sooner would be better. And in the meantime, if this presentation can be added to today's um, uh, date on the calendar for the website, um, so that it's with our, it, it can be an addendum to our packet and posted as a separate link. So that for those who have been watching and want to take a better look at it, they can. For simplicity's sake, can we just get a link to this thing emailed to us? Yeah, I can send it as well. Yeah, that would be great. In addition to it, yeah. All right, great. Bob. Um, just so the board's aware, there is one other request that's covered by the language. I have a text in here on Pine Ridge Road. We don't need to talk about it tonight. It's there's a stop sign that was placed there during the MWRA West Street project on a temporary basis. Uh, the police department can talk to you. They think they find it to be used on a permanent basis, but it's not in the regulations that way. So just to throw that out there. It kind of should be part of your hearing. All right. Um, maybe we'll cover that first, since sure. that'll probably be briefer. So if anyone has opinions on that, they don't have to sit through the entire yeah. parking lot. We've been asking um, if we're going to vote on the senior center, the overnight right. Milwaukee and the senior center, senior center only, but that's, that's, that's the, the stuff hearing. Julie should yeah. be the fourth hearing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, uh, there was the slide with the homework, um, but then also, you know, considering some of the other things you heard today um, and the surgical yeah, fixes right as well. Um, so the surgical fixes, the system-wide modifications. Um, that might be good to discuss it up front, do whatever you want to do with it. I mean, I'm a yes to all of those, so. But I'll send a link to the presentation so you can, like, really sit with it and yep. ruminate on it. Do our homework. In your spare time. We have tomorrow. Yeah, we do. Excellent. Yeah. Um, all right, so we're approaching 11 o'clock. Um, I'm going to suggest we table minutes. And is there anything that people would like to add or consider for future oh, agendas? Okay. Yes. Um, so I think the, the issue of the, the small cell tower is that on our next meeting? Uh, there is a okay. Bob, I don't have the future agendas list in this packet. Is uh, small cell towers, is that? Oh, it is, it's in the back. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. Right before the, um, before the minutes. minutes. I'll need to work with like the 77. Oh, I see. 76. Okay. There's some things that have to be done or should be done in the list that don't have to be done. Okay. Um, so then we've got the cell tower, which has been requested, so that's, and... that's kicked off for February. That's now into March? Yeah. If, if ever. If ever. Okay. That may be solved. Okay. Uh, do you have anything else? You, you have to so close the warrant for town meeting. That's important. And for yep. the election. Okay. And I'll bring... I'll send you an update. I have one item that yep. I would really like to get taken care of as soon as possible. I am going to bring up the, the the extra days, not a policy change, but just the extra days, so that we can mitigate their you know, their their problem. We've got a lot of girls that are going to be denied the opportunity for having a proper season because of inaction. So I, I realize we cut uh, recreation or we cut liaison short today because we had a lot going on. But I will do a delayed liaison report for recreation. Andy and I attended the last recreation committee meeting, um, and as the board had asked, we put this in front of them and, and asked their opinion um, on sort of some days and, and allocating days um, to a specific uh, week. And what came of it is that when you look at the
calendar, there's about eight to ten weekends in the spring session. They've been allocated one. One is Mother's Day, one is Memorial Day. Which they're not looking towards. Which nobody all. wants those days. So what happens is that if we, and they've already, in recreation, as is within their purview, already granted the softball league one extra Sunday morning. Right. Um, if we as the board were to allocate three extra Sundays to one team, mm -hmm. because they have a ton of interest and they want to schedule more games because they have more girls, what that does is it limits the flexibility that we have to grant other teams that also share that space um, any more Sunday morning should they, have, should they be rained at. And so what we're doing is we're saying, okay, to this one league, you can have these extra days to expand your league, but now we're denying any makeup days for any other teams. So then next year when we're faced with the same situation, they're gonna say, well, now our league is bigger, now we need more days. So now we're, we're in, the same, in the same boat. Um, so I am not, so that, that is my sort of report as it came you know, from feedback from recreation. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd also like okay, to, to add um, Vanessa's right in what she in what she said. Um, I think the recreation has, from the what I heard, has a pretty good handle on the on shuffling around so many. And, and Jenna is quite good. It was quite helpful as well. Um, at at shuffling around all of these teams in field space and. Um, that they did say, as I correct me if I'm wrong, but th that they they might need they might need a Sunday option, but they wouldn't know till closer to the season, and depending on the weather and when they can get started and, and the rain events. Well, um, one of the that's an that's an incorrect. I I know that's what they told you. Yes, that's incorrect information. That they uh, waiting until April or May. And then basing it on weather, this isn't a weather-dependent situation that they're in. They're in a situation where they need to lay out a schedule and accommodate the amount of young ladies that they have playing. So, just as a point of clarification, because I've spoke to them as well, that is not the what they have been communicating to me, and it is not what they have communicated in record to uh, to recreation committee in the meetings that I have been at. There request for the three days has been strictly focused on the fact that if it rains and they have to rejuggle schedules, it's really challenging for them. If, if their league is growing, and that's fantastic that, that more children, because I, I, I know they have some boys too, um, are interested in playing, then that's great. But we also have to, we, we have an equity issue where we have to be fair to all of the sports teams. And, and they're, you know, they're, I applaud them for trying to get ahead of this, but I also don't want to inadvertently penalize other teams because they didn't come to so us. So what teams would be they be penalizing? And, and she also, Jenna also mentioned that 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 many of the uh, of the uh, group, the athletic groups are growing in size. Yeah. So lacrosse, soccer, men's softball, t-ball, and high school teams. Okay. So. But I, look, we we have to be careful here because it's not technically on the agenda. I. To, to, to sort of go down this path. Um, you asked, I reported, um, but as far as, you know, personally, I'm not inclined to add them to the agenda for the three days because I don't think it's fair based off of what we heard from the Recreation Committee to offer that many days, half the season to one team. Well, there's, a, there's several pretty simple solutions to this, N uh, number one. Number two, it sounds like that we're getting conflicting information. You and I are getting conflicting information. I'm hearing one thing from the league. You're hearing another thing from recreation. Well, I'm, and I'm, I'm not suggesting that's one league. right or the other. Well, I don't know who you're speaking to because the president of the league has contacted me directly. And I've this with them too. <laughs> okay, then why don't we get him in here and get him out in public and let's let's hear it. But well, that doesn't resolve the issue we're faced with, which is that we'd be giving half the Sunday mornings in a season to one team. Well, you're, are you are correct that we shouldn't be going down this path as far as we have. And so I'm going to be very respectful of that. But I will point out one thing. <clears throat> Every Sunday for eight weeks, 
during the same window of time, um, the same block of time, <coughs> in a different time of year. Okay, there are little boys playing every Sunday morning, 150 yards from this location, every Sunday morning, and now we have little girls who are saying, "We're not going to let you do that on Sunday morning." That's not fair, John. That is well, that's it's not true. Maybe it's not fair, it's but it's true. Trick. Can I make a suggestion? We're, we're, we're far afield of is it on the agenda or not. <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> so if, right. it's, if there's a feeling it should go on the agenda, maybe it should go on to the 11th of Feb where there's a little bit of time and it could be discussed, but I think otherwise we need to stop the discussion of it. That's fair. I have a requ request for um, something on the agenda, uh, on the next, next agenda, just short, but I think it would be good for us as a board per the charter to sit down and um, provide feedback to the town manager on the, the budget. I, I know that some have oh. e emailed and um, but I think we should do that as a as a board per, per the charter. It doesn't yeah. have to be long we, we might you know um, I don't. I don't have um, like a view as to what the outcome should be on, on the, the the softball situation, but I do think it because it was an issue that was brought before the board, we should add it to an agenda in February. Uh, I will work with Bob to see what I can do, but I. Mm -hmm. I <laughs> the, the parking discussion is going to dictate a lot of how much else you can do. Quite honestly, yeah. mm -hmm. maybe the eleventh is a better date. Well, I, we'll work. We'll so work. I'll, I'll talk to Bob. Noted, um, Andy, uh, you your suggestion for budget discussion time for the fourth. Um, Bob, let's also see what we can do mm -hmm. there because that really would need to happen on the fourth. Mm -hmm. One other question. Yep. So the discussion regarding Daniel's house. Um, I don't know if there's going to be anything we can do, but I'm wondering if we should just kind of keep it in mind, especially after this this meeting takes place, and if the board is going to want to have some involvement or not I would want to have a placeholder on the agenda to deal with it as a board I don't think you're going to fit that in in February honestly yeah. mm. we, I don't know that it's, it's hard to know what information we'll have then that we don't have today yeah. if we have uh, today's information there's nothing to discuss the other thing here that we may want to consider is having one person act as the primary contact for the neighborhood same way as we do mm. with the other developments yeah um, so, um, given this, hmm? make that a liaison report so we come into each meeting. Yeah. yeah, same as all the others. You know, we had Andy come in, you and I, you know, yep. others. So, yep. um, yeah, yeah, I, mean, I think that's a good I, approach. To yeah. I would recommend myself just because I live there and I know the neighbors. Yeah, and, and Bob, could you? They, a lot of people said uh, other select boards or town. Uh, city councils or whatever were able to advocate for oh, one the, okay the, the one. city council that doesn't have the same powers as you okay they have many more they have many more so so I just want to us to be clear whether or not yeah. we have a role here right um, the, the role of a town select board and a city council is quite different okay so you would let us know if there was a way where we could I mean I think I can't say yeah. that yet because yeah. I, today I can't answer that after the 30th I might have a lot more information based on the council may have a lot to say right. based on what they've told us I get it it's being extended to you so I do have some contacts with the Boston City Council if yeah um, just to yeah. reach out and find out what they did yeah, yeah. Yeah, that would be uh, Yeah, I, I don't. I don't mean that we nix a sober house. No, um, I understand. I, I, what I what I mean is, I think to help the sides come together, sure. understand each other, yeah. and mm -hmm. and make sure people's needs are met. All right, great. Thank you. Um, we will table minutes, and do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. There's second. Second. All those in favor? Excuse me.